My boss wait, and I. Wait, wait, when, when You're going to bonk me for this, but the phrase meat ranch would make sense as like a euphemism for cum. Yeah, no, that is a bonk. Well, yep, hold on. <laughs> if you think of it like the salad uh, yep. dressing. You are correct. That that's <laughs> 322. Where I'm your start, mind went to. I'm going to start calling it meat ranch from now on. On today's part of my take, we got two friends, two old school friends on the show to talk about the Sweet 16, Elite Eight, Stanford Steve with some picks, Coach Tom Crean with some analysis, catch up with him, what his next move might be, some vampire bat talk. We'll talk uh, the QB carousel that doesn't stop, Billy's spreadsheet update, Hot Seat Cool Throne, and Guys on Chicks, and it's brought to you by our friends at Venmo. Whether it's tickets to the game or wings for your viewing party, pay friends back quickly, easily, and safely with Venmo. I love to use Venmo. It's very easy. You can send money to anyone. I use that hashtag PMT. And guess what? If you do that, you can be uh, eligible for $500 of free money. They're doing something cool with Venmo right now. We're giving out $100,000 to AWLs throughout the tournament. All you have to do is send a payment of any amount. Even a penny is fined. Include... The hashtag PMT in the payment note, you do that, and you can win up to $500 from Venmo for free. It's super, super easy, and when you win the money, screenshot your winnings, post it to Twitter or Instagram, and tag part of my take. We'll be retweeting and reposting all tournament long. Win up to $500 when you include hashtag PMT in Venmo payments throughout basketball season. Again, make sure to post on Instagram or Twitter for us to see. Venmo's a great sponsor. Go download Venmo right now. Best way to uh, have transactions with your friends. You know, you're going to games. Baseball's about to be back. Hey, beer on me. All right, I'll Venmo you later. That's the way to do it with Venmo. Super easy to use. And use that hashtag PMT when you make a transaction in the month of March. And you can win up to $500 for absolutely free. Okay, let's go. Welcome to part of my take presented by Venmo. Go use Venmo any transaction right now in the month of March. Use the hashtag PMT and you can get $500 for free, absolutely free from Venmo. Today is Wednesday, March 23rd, and the QB carousel will not stop. No, we don't know about Baker yet. So we're recording this at 323 in the afternoon on Tuesday. Don't know if Baker's going anywhere, but Matt Ryan got shipped from Atlanta to Indianapolis for a third round pick. Which I actually like the move. I think Matt Ryan, and I know Colts fans are now in this, uh, you know, purgatory where they keep trying a different quarterback every year. And I think the last four years have been Jacoby Brissett, Phillip Rivers, Carson Wentz, Matt Ryan. I still think they have a good enough team that, like, Phillip Rivers, remember, that team, they were uh, very close to beating the Bills in that first round playoff game. Getting into the playoffs is the name of the game. Well, and then the, rolling the dice. They should have made the playoffs this year, right? But their defense let them down in that last game at Jacksonville. Correct, but it's uh, I, I I like the move. I don't know. I know Matt Ryan um, gets shit on. I think he's an above average quarterback. He probably doesn't have many years left. It's great that they have a decent offensive line, right? Because as we, I think you were the first person that I heard say that he's the most sackable quarterback. He is. Um, His body just takes absorbs sacks. Kirk Cousins, I would also add to that yep. list though, because he just he has a way of kind of turtling in about himself. Yes. Anytime there's a pass rusher five yards away from him or closer. But Matt Ryan, I think he's actually I think he's a, a very good quarterback for the team that they've built in Indianapolis. And he's uh the most Indiana looking person maybe ever. Yes. So it's perfect. Like you created a, a video game character and you stopped halfway through because you didn't really care how much detail you wanted to put on his face. He is. He's perfect for Indiana. He's perfect for that team. I also think that a small part of this is the end of 28-3 jokes. Now, they'll always live on, but uh, I saw CBS Sports had a post that tried. It, it was the moment where I was like, okay, this might be over. Um, the Colts traded the third-round pick, and it's the 82nd pick in the draft. Mm -hmm. And they're like, three, eight, two – and then rearranged it twenty eight to three. It's like, all right, that's it's over. Numerology. You once that. you bring math yeah, into you can, it, you, you can't, can't do that. You can't like, do multiplication, division. You can't rearrange. Now, if something lines up twenty eight to three, right. I will see on it, and I will ten uh, percent chance if it's a tweet, I will I will click like on it. Right. If it was a, if it was the twenty eighth pick in the third round, yes. maybe that makes sense. But to say the eighty second pick overall, and then doing that, so that 
and, and Matt Ryan leaving, that's kind of the end of that era of Falcons. Mm, but I do like how even he was connected to go out to San Francisco, played with uh, Kyle Shanahan in Atlanta. That's when he won his MVP. And I just I, – I liked imagining him for the 49ers. That was fun for a little bit. But I, I do think that with what he does and what he does well, it's a good fit for the Colts. It's unfortunately always going to be from now on like – this is this trade is going to be compared to Carson Wentz, mm-hmm. and that's just how it's going to look like one third rounder to two third round picks, and I'm going to have that's to be, age. I'm going to have to be prepared to steal myself against that. That's age. That's age. I I also want to throw this out there, and I'm I'm wondering what you think. The to be a quarterback, never a better time to be a quarterback if you're an elite quarterback. Kind of a shitty time to be a quarterback if you're a, a yeah but guy because you mentioned Baker Mayfield. I think he might go to Seattle, but the the seats are are slowly filling up. Where like Baker Mayfield, where does he go? Does Jordan Love ever get a starting shot? Like Jimmy G, if he doesn't leave, what happens to Trey Lance? So it's awesome for Deshaun Watson, who gets two, what was it, two hundred thirty million guaranteed, mm-hmm. or Lamar Jackson, who's coming up soon, or Russell Wilson when his contract's up soon. But like the, that second, third, fourth tier of guys. It feels like they basically get a couple shots, and then it's like, all right, we're moving on. This realignment to me also feels like when uh, when the West, for the first time in a long time, got really good in the NBA. Yeah. You know, like, what was that, 15 years ago, whenever yeah. that was, 20 years ago, when the West just became the dominant uh, side uh, of the NBA? This is like the AFC just continues to stack up quarterbacks. I If, if I were an NFL player, I would want to play in the NFC right now. If uh, I'm a quarterback, it's yeah. like, send me to the NFC. I've got Aaron Rodgers, who's got you know probably a couple more years, and then he's done. Tom Brady, who knows how long he'll be around before he goes to Las Vegas into the AFC. But as far as the NFC goes, it's like wide open. It's wide. Yeah, the the there was a moment in time yesterday. This was before Jameis re-signed with the Saints, which we're very excited yes. for, and Marcus Mariota signed with the Falcons. But the quarterbacks in Tom Brady's division were Sam Darnold, Josh Rosen, and Taysom Hill. Yeah, like that's why he came back. It's not a. It's not a. It's not, there's no mystery behind the fact that Tom Brady looked around the landscape and was like, oh, we're guaranteed to go to the playoffs, Yeah, I'm, no matter what. I'm very glad to see Jameis back with the Saints. It was it's going like, to be great. It's going to be awesome. I want a full season of Jameis down there and a full season of off-season training videos, which is already way ahead of schedule right now. I don't know if you've seen him moving around on his leg. Six, one, three, four. Yeah, he had like one drill where I'm pretty sure his trainer was doing something like throwing golf clubs at him while he was trying to throw a wiffle ball through a hula hoop. He was it also was awesome. He was the one in where he was in like a huge parachute, inflated, <laughs> yeah. trying to run on a treadmill. But it, the I the, went hard knocks, Jameis Winston. Yeah, yes, just Jameis. The question though, so like Lamar again, he's going to get his money. He deserves his money. Russell Wilson will get his money. He deserves his money. But like Kyler Murray, I don't know because Kyler Murray feels right now. In that very close but not there guy, do you give him all that money? And would Kyler Murray, like, some team's going to give him some money. Right. It's probably going to be a team that's in a very tough position quarterback-wise that is just going to take an absolute shot at him if the, if the Cardinals end up not re-signing him uh, and not extending him. And then I don't think that he's got it. He doesn't strike me as a backup quarterback, like an extended career backup. No, I agree. And th- that's the part where – it's great to be an elite quarterback, and that's not really saying anything new, but I do think those those next guys, like Baker Mayfield, he's he's going to get another shot starting, but it won't be that long of a shot. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's not going to be so, – no one's going to probably trade for him and be like, he's our franchise quarterback guaranteed. He's got to kind of prove it again, mm-hmm. which about, is weird to think. What about the Panthers? The Panthers seem like they're the ones that are like, they're hosting an open house well, and every house on the street is closing and uh, they're just not getting anybody involved at all. Matt Rule, there was pictures of Matt Rule giving Kenny Pickett the eyes. Well, Big there, time there the were eyes. the eyes. There was also their GM, Scott Fitterer, who called Pickett over when he was doing his pro day so he could look at his hands. Yep. And then Ben McAdoo is their offense coordinator and quarterback coach. And Ben McAdoo was like, here, hold this football for me. Yeah. Well, I got Kenny. I got one more. I'm sorry, Wes. I, I lied. I got one more. What led, <laughs> uh-huh. what led to the glove? And then in the video, he's just staring at Kenny Pickett holding the football <laughs> and just nodding his head like, yeah, 
Oh, that'll do. That could do it. That'll yeah, his, do. his hands grew by an eighth of an inch. It did, yeah. He's a so grower, not a Kenny. shower. We love Kenny. We're a big Kenny podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else from the NFL free agency? It's been, I feel like I just came up from air from March Madness. I was, I slept like 11 hours on Monday night and I still am tired. Yeah. Um, I went to bed super early last night. So on uh, Sunday night after we did the show, I went back to my hotel room and I couldn't get in on Saturday night. My, my door lock was broken to my room, went back on uh, Sunday night, tried to get in again my door lock was broken a second time. They it's they had to send security up to uninstall and reinstall my door lock. So I just sat down in the lobby for about an hour, hour and a half, waiting for them to do that. So I'm basically on E. What's up, Hank? I'm very much on E. That's horrible. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. It was bad. It was it you, was uh, quite. And then basically, like I had to just tell. I couldn't be. I could, there was nobody there for me to take my frustration out in real time because the security guard was trying to help me, and it's not his fault. The door's right, locked. Right. Everybody was trying to help me. And I couldn't. There was nobody for me to scream at. I need somebody. Billy should have been there. Billy should have been, been, been there. He, well, he had St. Patrick's Day for he, five he days. Yeah. Are we, Billy, are we down from the St. Patrick's Day high from your White History Month excursion? Yeah, yeah it's over. Finally, finally a holiday for you. Needed it. How yeah. much? Uh, how much Irish are you? Around like over half. Oh, nice. Over half. Over that half. sounds like over half. Exactly fifty percent. Yeah, sixty-five. Oh, sixty-five. <laughs> Damn. It's not even a Pulled fraction. Yeah. Billy, yeah. what does the Matt Ryan uh, trade to Indianapolis do for Sam Ellinger's stock? Uh, he needs some guidance in his first real starting season, so he'll just be a veteran who helps Sam really get it going. Oh, okay. So Matt Ryan won't even start. I yeah, like they're, that. They're of course. Gi- no, they're giving. I think they're giving Sam the the Aaron Rodgers treatment. Yeah. He just needs to sit for four years, then he gets in and he'll take over the league. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's a scary time if you if you need a quarterback and you're like you're. You're a franchise basically telling yourself you're a f- uh, old quarterback away from being a Super Bowl team. That's what the formula is now. Yeah. Just get an old quarterback. And I'm plug s- him in. I've been sitting on the sidelines watching all this happen, being like, I, th- I think I think Justin Fields is my guy. What he gets <laughs> I, think, I think. He gets his first full offseason right. in this new system. Yes, but I there's that there's the whole group of, of fan bases, the Jets with Zach Wilson, the Jags with Trevor Lawrence, like we're just sitting there and saying, yeah, no, no, we're good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we're good. We're, we're fine. We don't need this. So, and maybe we do. In mm-hmm. two years, we'll be right back into it. Um, anything else, Jake? The, uh, like, any big picture tournament things that have come to you since since Sunday night? Um, Not necessarily. There was a cool uh, thread about St. Peter's and just how insane their run Give it to us. Is right I now. like cool threads. Yeah. Is so this about the, the the facilities? Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. Is, this Give is it to us. Preposterous. Yeah. Just insane. Having uh, some internet issues. Uh, okay. Oh, Got it. It's yeah. This fucking Pete scumbag. Yeah. It's the Russians. That's yeah. The Russians. Said. Yeah. The yeah. Saint, that's what he told me. It's Saint Petersburg. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, from Ryan Patrick Warner. I think he used to be on staff there. Uh, staff for two years. Players could not blast music during team lifts because the weight room bordered on classes going on. Not physical education classes. The weight rooms, while literally bordered, where Philosophy 101 was taught. Holy shit. That's awesome. They should actually, Philosophy 101, any philosophy class should also have like a workout facility inside of it. Yeah. The year after he left, they were supposed to play an ESPN U game against Manhattan, packed with students. Notice boom lift on court during warm-ups and people mopping. Game was canceled due to leak in roof. Oh, fuck. Okay. Uh, the press conferences were held in a yoga slash spin studio downstairs. There was a pool in Yanatelli, which is the name of their facility, I believe, that SPU would rent to any paying customer. A visiting coach walking downstairs <laughs> post-game would regularly encounter screaming kids in squ- swim gear and random people in tower- towels post Holy shit. So, yeah, like so Saturday afternoon like the in y. February, yeah. they're playing yeah. a game at noon. And they come down, and there's just kids with pool noodles. This actually sounds a lot like the Bengals facility right now. This is and incredible. the Bengals made the Super Bowl. Yeah. So like, yeah, year of cheap franchise. Year of the year of the cheapskates. Let's go. The offices routinely flooded because they're at top of the facility. A photo of the flooding in the offices. <laughs> okay, it's crazy. Uh, Loyola was supposed to come one year. There was no hot water in the building. Players departed to the facility post game to board the flight home to Chicago with long faces and no showers. Okay, that sucks. Yeah, that's yeah, very stinky that's flight. Brutal. Uh, 
Canisius came once. They arrived that, and f- to find out the corridor outside the locker room is flooded due to a burst pipe. They really have some water issues there, don't they? Yeah. Okay. And then from Iona, my second year at Iona from someone, during warm-ups at St. Peter's, someone took a jumper, hit, it, hit the rim, and the rim just fell off the basket. 40-minute <laughs> <laughs> delay. Like a haunted house. Had to get a new basket. And this team is in the Sweet this 16. This team beat Kentucky and is, is in the same region as North Carolina, UCLA, and Purdue. Unbelievable. That's so funny. Like, how embarrassing is that for the person that bricked the shot so hard that they yeah. broke the basket? Yeah, retire. Yeah, I think you got to quit. There's... I wish that there was video out there of that because I would have so many good things to tweet at Russell Westbrook. Oh man, that would he would he would have cost you. Yeah, I bet you. I bet you Russell Westbrook could break a basket with a missed shot. Yes, absolutely. Well, he doesn't usually hit the the actual rim. Right, it's more the back. He would shatter it. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, and then before we get to hot seat, cool throw, Billy, your spreadsheet update from March Madness. All right, so the spreadsheet has done a little better than I thought it would, so we're in a good position already. Okay, what does that Hang mean? On. It means how so much is it lost? Up money. <laughs> this feels like Billy's trying to sugar sugar yeah. us up. Well, you didn't give us the project- projection of what you thought it would be like, so now you can just be like, in it's retrospect, better. I thought I was going to lose ninety percent of my money. I only lost eighty nine. I'm up big. Well, basically, before the tournament started, we put a thousand dollars into the original strategy. Okay. So then we saved some of that other money for adjustments. St. Patrick's Day, five days of St. Patrick's Day. That, that, yeah, that's bit part of, of the process. Yeah, that little, that's little part of the process. Yeah. So we made four new sh- future bets for this next to this new scenario to adjust it. So we put on all the original ones, and then we added 200 on the Kansas future, 150 on a Houston future, 100 on a UCLA future, and 100 on a Purdue future. Okay. So we have 500 left. Okay. That we can use for anything. So with all the bets currently placed, here are the outcomes. What happens if St. Peter's wins? That's a bad outcome. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. That, I, that, I that, that. So that okay. would mean that we lost everything. We lost 1,300 <laughs> of the 2,000. Okay. okay. But all not right, all so of it. Yeah, yeah. Not but all, not all right. of it. Go ahead. Um, so if Gonzaga wins, that's going to be down 1,000. What? Wait, but, so if the most likely outcome happens, we've lost half the money. Right. But <laughs> okay, in the future, in the wait, future let, let me, we mitigate for it by putting the 500. Yep. That's yep. like the emergency yep. parlay. That was the emergency parlay on Gonzaga. R- like if if like basically we're still far away. But Gonzaga's going Gonzaga. to be a favorite. Right. They but like they could lose. They could. I like how Billy. Yeah, they Mark, absolutely. Can. Mark Few. If one of his dogs gets a hold of the game plan. So here's a, here basically here's who we're rooting for: Providence, Kansas, Michigan, Houston, Purdue, UCLA, North Carolina. So not What's the, the one most in, we can make. Not the overall Three number of those teams. Yeah. are all in the same region. Right, and also <laughs> not the overall number one and two seeds. Right, Arizona and Gonzaga. But Jake, that also means if they're all in the same region, means that one of them. Is going to make the final four. True, right. it's fair. It's fair. True. And I then, think this is going to be a good like. We I think w- Billy actually is actually. Now that I'm thinking about it, Billy has guaranteed the impossible to happen. Gonzaga is going to win a national yeah, title. Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah, going to he, like he Gonzaga. Him. The only way Gonzaga was ever going to win a national title was Billy was going to set up an entire betting strategy based on them not winning the national title. Billy, but, Billy trying to execute this is like you. If you took uh, both Lenny and George from of mice and men and roll them into one character like the planning of one of them and then the execution of the big lummox uh-huh that's insulting yeah i read that book it no was. uh uh no so basically there might be a situation where if like like there could be a positive unless these three teams win then we put a parlay on those three teams if to win it might end up even how are you going to parlay though again gonzaga being a huge favorite Right, but I'll just incorporate that with other teams that we don't want to win. I like, l- for example, let's say we're in a situation where either St. P- if St. Peter's has to play in and we don't want them to win, we parlay St. Peter's winning with Gonzaga winning. But then St. Peter's loses and Gonzaga wins. Right. Then you lose. Then you lose. But the then, but then the person who beats St. Peter's, who we have a positive outcome, might win, and then they go on. Right, but I. It feels like we're doing a trap all the way along to Gonzaga winning it all. Yeah, so basically we really need Gonzaga to lose. Okay, so <laughs> what's, what's funny about Billy's proprietary system is that the outcome of it is exactly the same as everybody else during March Madness, which is 
bet a lot, lose a lot, and then save up some money for a last-second big shot parlay to try to bit, make your way back to even. I think we're going to end up having Gonzaga minus the points in the title game, and they're not going to cover, and they're going to win. That's probably it. <laughs> really, the worst situation of this is if Gonzaga goes like all the way to the championship. The best team in the country. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, again. Is, yeah. All I, right. I have a question, Billy. Yes. What is the outcome where we get the richest, and what is that number that we uh, get? Yeah. Mich- Michigan, we, we get five dollars each. Is sixteen hundred? Wait. Uh, so we that kinda, would that'd be so, thirty six hundred or yeah, thirty six hundred. If Michigan wins, if Providence wins, we're thirty one hundred, concluding the two K. Good. Um, Kansas, if Kansas wins, we're you know up three hundred. Okay. Twenty three hundred. And then if Houston wins, uh, 900, 2,800, including what we had before. So there are outcomes that are very feasible where we might walk away from this. Be like, okay, this, this whole thing was just like minus 110 on one game. But Right. That's the part that I always <laughs> struggle with is like I don't know what I'm rooting for except for Gonzaga to lose. Yeah. But, for example, like Gonzaga could get eliminated. A lot of the negative outcomes get eliminated by – other negative outcomes. <laughs> okay. So huh? wait, if it's a double, if our two worst nightmares come true at the same time, it's actually good. Yeah. Okay. If it's if it's Gonzaga and Arizona in the final, we lose everything. Uh, yeah. Is there <laughs> is there a way that we would actually lose everything? Yeah. No. Like we're Gonzaga, talking about uh, no, Arizona. No, we, in no we situation. Had some, we had some like five dollar money lines. In no situation do we lose all of the two thousand dollars. That was the strategy. What's the yeah. worst? Yes. What's the worst amount? We've made seven hundred already, right? Uh, or have won seven hundred. We we'll like, reinvested it. What's the worst? The worst is uh, we have seven hundred in the end, so we lost thirteen hundred. Right, Why so, wouldn't we put seven hundred on Gonzaga? Then? Yeah. So then what we do is we we cook well, up the a parlay I, using but, that seven hundred dollars, but we don't have to right now. Okay. All right, I, like, listen. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna trust the system. Like it would just take away future possible winnings, and like let's say Gonzaga were to lose this weekend, then we'd readjust. Yeah, I think next rich. readjustment would be elite eight, maybe halfway through the elite eight. Okay. So we see what we're doing. Yeah. So it'll I be like fun. Yeah, I mean this is fun. This is way too hard work. <laughs> Why this? This isn't fun. When you could have just bet one game. Yeah. But it was a good exercise. No, but we don't know yet. It, it might yeah. be a sound investment technique. Did you have a game so, that you loved? I didn't like any of it. Okay, I'm sure you, <laughs> you, you probably watched. No, all when of Saint Peter's again. when Saint Peter's won, that was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And you loved them money line against Kentucky. Well, I had five dollars on them, so we had sixty dollars, which paid for Kentucky's future. Ah, mm. that's damn. how it's really working. That's beautiful. Boom. All right, genius. Um, okay, Sh- uh, check out Berserker Sheets on Twitter. <laughs> Um, that's the guy that's him. doing all the work for me. No, no, I, he, <laughs> he like he just puts it all together. I told him what to do. Like, no, he we got a good system. Yeah, he like yeah, looks yeah, over. Yeah, every, like right, you just right. need someone to look over it, right? Yeah, and no, like he, be he like, is there any it. glaring mistakes? He's, he's like, triple, yeah, this doesn't make checks sense. Your math, yeah. and then he also puts together the graphics and tweets them all out for you after you tell him exactly precisely what to do. Just shout out him. I yeah. don't know who he is. He won't tell me who he is. I think he's like. What if it's like, yeah, it's fucking Elon Musk. Could be. <laughs> AWL. All right. All right, let's do uh, Hot Seat Cool Throne. Hot Seat Cool Throne is brought to you by our friends at Coors Light. The chaos of the big tournament can be unpredictable to say the least, and even the best players take a moment to cool off from the bench. When you need a breather, maybe it's watching too many games, or you got action on everything, or you're invested in the spreadsheet. You take a seat with a refreshing Coors Light, the beer that's literally made to chill. People wait all year for this, and the tournament is a perfect excuse to do nothing but chill and watch games with the beer that's made to chill. Coors Light. Uh, I'm just trying to think, like, TCU Arizona. That was the night where we could have used the Coors Light because that game went into overtime. We're sitting there. We're sweating everything out. That's a perfect time to chill. Call your own personal timeout with a Coors Light. We need a strategic timeout from the madness. Reach for that Coors Light. It's the beer that's made to chill so you can refresh the spirit and jump back into the excitement. Get Coors Light and the new look delivered straight to your door with Drizzly or Instacart by going to CoorsLight.com slash take. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. The coldest beer in the world. When those mountains are blue, that's when you need that timeout. Delicious Coors Light. Okay. Henry. Henri. Henri. Uh, my hot seat is Carl Crawford. Oh. Mm. 
That's not a name we've heard in a long time. Exactly. So I've been kind of following the situation just uh, like from the rap perspective. Megan the Stallion, to tale as old as time, signed a bad record deal, blew the fuck up, and is now upset with her. You know, the, the record company is trying to get out of it. Is now publicly tweeting, being and and this is how I found out. She tweeted Carl talking about the owner of the record label, which turned out to be Carl Crawford. What? Carl, I don't want to be signed to your pill popping ass. You talking about I ain't paid for a show and you sound slow. I'm the artist. I don't pay you directly. Maybe fight with the man you signed to and you might see some money, you fucking powderhead. Uh, she's she's been going off. She like did an album and then Carl Crawford. It, it sounds like Carl Crawford's in the wrong. They're trying to say that because on her album she did a lot of like interludes and talking. Yeah. So they said that there was only like 26 minutes of actual music and so that doesn't qualify as an album. And so she has to make another album before she can be done with her record deal. Uh, so that that part of it is like you've heard that story a million times. Bring back rap rap skits. I used to love those. Right. Well, apparently like that, Ludacris that's, would have an entire song about him trying to take a shit. That's this basically what it sounds like she was doing. But it's Carl Crawford is the owner of the record company. That's what the mind blowing part is. That is very mind blowing. Yeah. And, and he's he, a powderhead. He's a powder. According pill to poppin'. according according to uh, Megan Thee Stallion, pill popping. He made 125 mil in his career. But apparently he's, you know, trying to make more off, off Megan Well, it sounds style. like he made more off of her, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely. Sure. He, yeah. He's got a good eye for talent, clearly. So, what? Are, yeah, the rules are like it has to be 26 minutes worth of songs or I, more. I, that's just, just what... That, it seems like It seems like they are going off a of technicality of like they're just trying to squeeze as much out of her as they can. Couldn't you just make a really shitty album? Just like sit down and have like a basic drum beat going and then just say whatever comes to the top of her head and then boom that's a song all right new album's out right now check it out it sucks but i want to get out of this deal i think that's what the carl crawford's uh record company is trying to say she did but saying like arguing that that's not does not justifiable enough i mean mm. w when you think Free about carl, carl crawford's contracts the mlb guy knows how to negotiate he got paid <laughs> a lot of money for not being not that good of a player i was actually looking up i was on on the sport track looking up how, to much? See how much he made he made 145 but on it they have like uh they it has the season and it has the awards he had one season of awards <laughs> yeah he did 2010 he was a gold glove silver slugger and that's it and then he got the <laughs> huge contract with the red sox and a huge contract with the dodgers holy shit 179 mil 179 not 149 good for him. i think we're we got to be on the misses the stallion side on this one, oh yeah right? yeah i mean it was just one of those i think coley was the one that that brought it to my attention but it was like i because i had been i had been seeing this like dispute kind of just on like the the rap like world star hip-hop accounts and stuff that i follow just knowing megan the stallion's got a contract dispute and then last night it was like it's with carl crawford damn that's crazy free the stallion damn uh, uh and then my cool throne are deadbeat dads Nice. Why are you looking at me? Mo no, I'm no, not. Play Cats in the Cradle. Maury, Maury, God damn it. Maury got canceled. Oh, yeah, that sucks. What did he say? The, the show got taken off the oh. air. Oh. Yeah. That I'm sucks. OG canceling. I love, I love that Maury just made an entire career off of people getting so pissed off at each other that they wanted to embarrass each other on television. Yeah. Great it's show. Awesome. What a great, we were on it. We, we, we were, were on it. What a simple concept to have. Be like, hey, they don't know if, if this guy's the actual dad. Okay. Let's put him on national television and then reveal it. We should actually, we need to take over that concept. Maybe not us personally, but somebody here at this company should just become the paternity show. That the, Him getting canceled is, I mean, I didn't know he was still going. Great credit to him. Yeah. It's a formula. It's like people love watching Forensic Files and people yeah. love watching the Maury Povich show. It's, it's every, every episode sick. is the same. Yeah. And guess what? People are going to tune in. It's, it's pretty much kids get sick. And stay home from school, and parents. There are like people out there who either are retired or not working, and Maury is that void. I Price is right in Maury. I, you know what I want to do? This would be an and interesting. Springer, that's Jerry this would be an is interesting idea for a show. Something new. If you if you uh, followed up with all the families, and then interviewed the children that were revealed on the paternity test, and see how their lives turned out. Yeah, I'm sure that would be. I'm gonna guess at not, all. not great. Yeah, all right, it could be good. Yeah. Speaking of depressing, it made me feel very old. I, I tweeted out the clip, and I got a lot of people being like, "Where is this from?" Oh I yeah, like, five years ago, even. Yeah, but still, like, I, I always, know. I always just assume like things we've done as part of my take, like everyone follows, but it's like we haven't been doing it in a long yeah, time. Then I'm worried. Mm -hmm. um, all right, PFT, your hot seat, cool throne. Great uh, job, Hank. Good job, Hank. Thanks. My love hot... being back in studio with you. Love being. I love being with you guys wherever we are. Can't wait for Thursday night. Me, me neither. Coach K. Game of the year? 
No. Boo. Mm. Scared? No, I'm scared of the refs. I think the refs are going <laughs> to fucking throw this for, for Texas Tech, for Duke. Got it. Absolutely think that's what's going to happen. My hot seat is Donald Trump, the T-man, because the T-man. Uh, there's a new real estate king of the deals in town. Me. You remember on Firefest yeah. two weeks oh ago? My, God. my landlord Donald tried Trump. to jack up my rent $1,500 on me. Yeah. I emptied the clip on him. I power shifted on him. I'm basically on Shark Tank. I talked him down. He's only raising the rent $1,400 nice. on me now. Nice. That's big, dude. Signed. That's huge. That's 1200 bucks a year. My, my uh, spreadsheet that I created for myself is likely more profitable than Billy's. Yes. I just That's earned all you needed was bucks. something. We Got said that. <laughs> you just need something. I actually came back to him and I, I asked him if I could get, uh, I offered, I think, like, how about you just increase it $500 a month? So I asked for only a 33%. Uh, or 33% of what he was at, trying to get out of me. And then he just came back to me. He goes, my last and final offer is going to be an increase of $1,400. You can take it or move it. Beautiful. I was like, done. Beautiful. Sign me up. You got something. That bitch, I fucking cucked the shit out of yeah. him in this negotiation. He's, he's missing out on a lot of money. $1,200. Wh- what do you think I should spend it on? I'm going to spend it all in one place for I, sure. Oh, I think you have Gonzaga. to reinve- No, you have to oh. reinvest it in the spreadsheet. And build his spreadsheet? Yeah. And a cash. New cash infusion into the spreadsheet. Cash Maybe a season long MLB spreadsheet? Well, my yeah, <laughs> actually actually that's not a bad idea because wins I do, losses. I do have to I do have to figure out what the team's gonna be that I bet against every single game this year, like I did with the Pirates last year. The Reds. I made money. Could be the Reds. Got rid of well, I actually let me just say it right now, shouldn't be the Reds because the Reds are on my cool throne because they're if you look at their salary this year. They have a Hall of Famer as their sixth highest played player. Who's that? Ken Griffey Jr. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, the Reds are That's my that. cool throw. Anytime you get a guy who's been in the Hall of Fame and retired for like 15 years yep. as your sixth highest pay- player, he's getting paid uh, like $4 million till 2024. 20, uh, That's incredible. Good yeah. for, good for Cage, KGJ. <laughs> KGJ. Also, they're bringing... Oh, we always called him that. They're, they're probably bringing back... Uh, Tom Brinman or Tom Brinman is probably going to get a gig. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that he's been doing like some interviews. He's spent the last like year and a half rehabbing himself and just uh, he's been going to like a lot of uh, meetings of local LGBT mm-hmm. uh, just like organizations and just sitting and listening to what they have to say. <laughs> He's and, been going to the gayest towns in America. Yeah, he's yeah, he's and been just sh- not saying anything derogatory while yeah, there. Yeah, just like he's got himself hooked up to like an electric shock collar. Yeah, and every time he <laughs> wants to say it, from Key West to San Francisco, Tom mm-hmm. Brenneman has has not said anything offensive. It would be great if what? he just Urban it, Meyer. Oh yeah, oh Urban yeah. Meyer. Uh, I just remembered. We forgot to talk about. We forgot Urban to talk. Meyer. He doesn't know who Aaron Donald was. Although I, I that one's I did, that was it, bullshit. It was bullshit. That one's bullshit. I think he, he was probably like joking Wait, about. Wait, pretend like, I didn't say that. Say why? It. Oh, okay, that's Billy's. Okay, let's get Billy. You didn't say it. Okay. Uh, no, 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 it's fine. No, no, no. no we're talking about your cool throne. PFT. We're talking about later. Uh, my cool throne was going to be Kenny Pickett's hands, mm. but also Chevy Silverados because one drove through a tornado this I morning. I saw that, which is badass. So badass. That guy was. Where do you think that guy was on his way to? Where there's a tornado on the road, he was just like, "Fuck it." Yeah, probably. I got this. Probably, yeah. Probably, I know what that struck me. Crying. Probably had a date. Yeah. Shout out Buddha Ben. He does not wanted to call his. Mo- he called his mom on me. That's another early PMT thing that people probably don't remember. I tried to chase a tornado, and he literally threatened to call his mother on me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, my my hot seat is uh, fans because Yusuf. Nurkic threw a fan's phone. It came out. Now I don't know who to believe here. It's it was said that the fan said something about his mother and his grandmother. His his grandmother passed away from COVID in 2020. Um, but it just reminds everyone that if we just had my rule of every single player in every sport gets to pick out one fan a year and beat the ever living shit out of them, sports would be more fun. Mm-hmm. It there, would. There's been a, a recent pandemic of of players confronting fans. Right. We're, does, we're, does we're dancing NBA, around it. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, let's there needs do to, it. There needs, so it's like building up. It's like the lead up to World War I right now. It feels like it's a powder keg on the court, and something's going to happen to kind of break it wide open so that they can do something to fix it. Yeah. And I think you're right. I think if, one, once a year. if one fan gets the shit kicked out of him, I think this all stops. Yes, yes. Uh, all right, Billy, go ahead. Your hot seat. Uh, my first hot seat is Jorge Masvidal. He jumped his former opponent, Colby Covington, while he was at a steakhouse in Miami. Uh, he 
you know, that's just pretty crazy for fighters to actually just go hunt each other down. I like that after though. the fight. There should be a hunting league <laughs> where it's just like twelve guys sign up for it and they just hunt each other on site. Maybe that's anywhere. just the movie tack. Yeah, but it's like coast to coast. It's, yeah, but you just you don't know who is looking for you. You just know who you who your target is, and there's cameras following you. That's a million dollar idea right there, right off the top. In my other hot seat is Urban Meyer. Yes, Urban Meyer. Well, I, I mean, it's just. Every couple months, Urban Meyer has a story that we all get to make Urban Meyer jokes. I love it. It's just getting worse and worse and worse. You could <laughs> the, not, the Aaron Donald thing was bullshit. I, I think he was probably like, who's this 99 guy? How do yeah, you stop him? Right. I think, like, probably knew who Aaron Donald was after doing... Well, the, maybe the funniest part was he said that he did a six-month deep dive on the NFL. That Mike sounds like... Mike McCarthy. Him and yeah, Mike McCarthy. Him and Mike McCarthy together just hung out and watched... Uh, like tapes of red zone. Yeah, they got pro football focus logins and didn't never logged in. Yeah, so uh, he's just basically being a dickhead to everybody. He, the other two guys that they said it's like one of these things is not like the others. They said Urban Meyer didn't even know who uh, Aaron Donald, Debo Samuel, or Jamal Adams was. <laughs> yes, yes, Jamal Adams. I think the source yeah, on this was probably yeah, Jamal, Jamal Adams. Jamal Adams PR team definitely threw that one in there. Mm -hmm. I just Urban Meyer like. It's just so funny because we're now getting to a few people still online defending him, and I love those people. Oh, yeah. They are just incredible. Like, the, the, the amount of evidence that Urban Meyer is a complete shithead is overwhelming, yet there are a few people who are just – I had one guy yesterday who was, who was touting all three titles in college football. It's like, are you a Florida and Ohio State fan or just an Urban Meyer fan? Mm -hmm. uh, one of those guys has a picture of him with Urban Meyer – in his profile picture, and I know it because every time I say something about bad about Urban Meyer, he's like, you would say something like this, Lib. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, just a I great... Ju it's I a, get libbed out. Yeah, it's just a great like group of people on the internet who are standing so firm on a guy who, like... I mean, it's pretty much been every two months there's been a story like, this guy sucks. Yeah. Nah, I, we love I, him. I agree with you, though. I hope those people never go away. Yeah, I, Because the they have to have somebody, otherwise it's it's not fun anymore. Right. But I think a new story is going to come. It's going to be like a slow trickle of information because people see how well these articles do. Everyone loves reading about Urban Meyer being a dickhead. It's the best. So I hope the stories keep coming out with like new funny little anecdotes. There was one guy that replied to it uh, that was a former player. I forget who it was, but a former player of Urban's at Ohio State. And he said... When he was at Ohio State, Urban would drive some of the players around sometimes to go to meet and greets, and he drove like the biggest asshole of all time. They would get in his Audi, and he would never stop at stop signs. He would blow through red lights, like didn't even come close to stopping, and just speeding all around town to the point where his players were like, hey, coach, why are you driving like this? And he goes, well, because when I get pulled over, the interaction usually goes something like this. Oh, wow, it's you, Coach Urban Meyer. Great season last year. Yeah, thank you. All right, have a great day. And then he'd drive away. So he was like bragging to people <laughs> how he was literally above the law. Yes. Uh, I just, I love what a villain he is. Yeah. He's, he, he's, he's a power hungry guy who has lost all his power. So watching it like fall on itself is very, very fun. I really think that the worst punishment that they could have had for him is not firing him, but just making him continue to coach and lose yeah. on the Jaguars. And that's why he would go through those like, I think those uh, the the mental issues and like the the fake sicknesses that he would have the brain cramps. would just be because his entire ego is built around him being successful and beating people. That when there's even just like a small crack in that foundation of him starting to think maybe you're not as big a winner as you've been saying to yourself in the mirror for the last twenty years, he just crumbles. Yeah, he, he doesn't know how to process. It. Losing is poison for him. It really it is. is poison for his body. All right, Billy, your cool throne. My cool throne is half half Thor Bjornsson. Uh, this is a not a well known storyline, but the mountain from Game of Thrones mm -hmm. has had serious beef with a guy named Eddie Hall, who's another fellow strongman. Is that the guy who who did the crazy deadlift and bled out of his eyes? Probably, probably it was did it so once. Sick. Yeah, yeah. So those they've guys been beefing for years. Over the weekend in uh, Dubai, they had a boxing match that was pretty awesome. It was the heaviest boxing match of all time. They both cut down to fighting weight and fought. And what half their weight. Uh, half Thor Bjornsson was about 350 pounds. So not pounds. the heaviest. Rough and Rowdy has said heavier. Vito Torpedo was like 450. He fought someone that was like 500. Yeah. Professional sanctioned fight. So yeah. what did you fight in? 
Pro- mm. I I actually mm. fought professional. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. but but the, <laughs> That's no, but the other guys oh, on the but you fought rough and rowdy. The only time I had to do that, I thought rough and rowdy wasn't professional. I'm I'm confused now. It's amateur, but because Jose had to fight professional, I had to go professional to fight Jose. Oh, you oh, ranked yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah, which it was ridiculous. That's why he can't fight it with his hands. Yeah, well, now he can because it's been over a year. Right. So, um, <laughs> That's yeah. why I went to St. Patrick's no. Day because he could, this is Billy's, <laughs> this is Billy's like divorce yeah. moon where you just go out with your friends because you can finally fight after being mm-hmm. cooped up for so long. No, but the craziest part was Hathor Bjornsson cut down from over 400 pounds and like at his lightest and he's pretty jacked right now he's 350 all muscle so it was just who won half thor bjornsson the but, mountain yeah but eddie hall was just throwing haymakers it's actually pretty it's a terrible boxing fight to watch if you like like good boxing but it was a crazy spectacle and i can't believe those guys were landing punches at like 350 pounds and their faces are just weren't exploding it's pretty insane that is, that is nuts. i'm gonna have to watch it uh, should give Jake. them swords next time finish this and off. then film it and then put it on hbo uh, my hot seat's the Toronto Maple Leafs. They are mm-hmm. they have jerseys designed by Justin Bieber debuting tonight on Wednesday night. Now, they're not that bad this season. They're tied for third place looking at the standings now, but I don't know. This is a perfect opportunity for the Bieber curse to be born oh, if they yeah. start losing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to look don't like the, the Bieber. Well, can you curse Maple Leafs? They're pretty cursed. Yeah, they haven't come, come out of the first round since 2013. What's wrong with the Biebs? But it could be the Bieber blessing if they keep yeah. winning. Ooh, I like that. Oh, yeah. I see the jerseys. Then, then their hashtag is going to have to be just like, I believe. Yeah, I believe. This is weird. Yeah. They're just wearing And they're reversible. Colors. Okay. They look like Steelers jerseys. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, my cool throne is Al Michaels. So he got the bag from Amazon. Thursday night football. Unfortunately, this means the end for the best duo, Al and Chris. Wow. But no, no love for a friend Joe Buck. You really hate Joe, I, though. I think Al and Chris... Oh, no! I love Joe. Uh, Do you? Well, you have to. Oh. You just all right. I, we're, at, we're on the top of a mountain. Al and Chris are about to fall off the mountain, and Joe Buck is on the other side, about to fall off the mountain. You can only save one. Joe, because he's a friend of the program. I don't think Why you are you mean that. Kill Al and Chris. I mean, I was, that's brutal. You're gonna have that reaction either way. Well, it's no. kind of crazy because Chris is a friend of the program. So, oh, so is Chris. You just yeah. murdered. Yeah, him. I'm more of a play-by-play guy. Yeah. So, so. who who gets killed? I use my strength. Grab both. Oh wow! What double double sportsmanship. What yeah. a hero! <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, he's gonna be calling Thursday night on Amazon with Kirk Herbstreet. Yeah, like, I like it. I'm interested. Yeah. I think they'll get along well. They seem like if you put those two, like if you if you put them in a mason jar together, like they're bugs, they'd probably become fast friends. Yeah, Herbie can get along with anyone, and Al is the consummate professional, like you said. Mm-hmm. Who All gets right. uh, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit? Is he still involved in this trade? I have no clue. That's the that's the cartoon that was traded to uh espn from nbc for al michaels oh when they originally got him from Sunday. go look up that you'll love that that's a that's a fun little fact um all right so let's get to our interviews good job jake and billy uh thank you we have stanford steve our good friend stanford steve then we have tom cream coming after that pft you got a quick word from our sponsor before we get to stanford steve want to talk to you about bird dogs i love bird dogs it's almost short season when it's short season it's bird dog season They've got awesome joggers, too. It's not just shorts anymore for bird dogs. They are the most comfortable shorts in the world, but guess what? They've stepped into the joggers space, and they're dominating it. They are the most comfortable joggers in the world. I love joggers just in general. I think that they're the most uh, versatile type of pant, and bird dogs is absolutely dominating it. Go to birddogs.com. You can enter promo code PMT. They're going to throw in free bird dogs whistle tip football. That's right. Just like the old Vortex footballs, you can probably throw them Malik Willis type distances. Go check out their all new pants colors. Use the promo code PMT. That's birddogs.com, promo code PMT, and boom, a free bird dogs whistle tip football with your pair of bird dogs. You will not take these things off. I promise you. They're great for wearing around the house, they're comfortable enough to just wear on your couch, and they look good enough to wear to work. We love their joggers, and we love their shorts, too. I've probably got 12 pairs of shorts. It's the only type that I wear anymore. Bird Dogs is a great company. We wear them all the time. Check them out right now. Go to birddogs.com, promo code PMT, and you're going to get that free whistle tip football with your pair of Bird Dogs. Now, here is Stanford Steve. All right, we now welcome on our very good friend. It is Stanford Steve. We're going to talk some Sweet 16 picks and also... 
uh, are planned for New Orleans because he has booked his flight. He will be there. Titus will be there. The greatest uh, wing date of all time will be there. So, Steve, let's start with uh, the tournament so far. You you were touting around. I saw you, you. You're a man of many talents. You do hits everywhere. You had 21 team list of teams that could win the championship. How many of those are still alive? 16. Whoa. Not bad. Wait, no. I'm kidding. I'm yeah, kidding. I'm kidding. Saint I'm kidding. That would mean no, that you not, have all of them. Yeah. I did not have St. Peter's. I did yes. not have St. Peter's on the list. Uh, I was happy on because I revised it on March 1st. Uh, and then uh, before the – on March 1st, I took off that list. Michigan State, Indiana, Marquette, Ohio State, and Alabama. So we got rid of the good teams that 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 could not do it. So – yeah, I, I, all, every other team besides St. Peter's was on that list is 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 alive and and still kicking here. It's pretty impressive, Steve. Um, before we get to more basketball, I did want to ask you about your uh, your pre media career because it's something that I don't think that we've talked about on this show at all. I was reading Uh-oh. your bio today. I saw that you were the national high school player of the year in Dude, football. He was sick. He was recruited at Notre Dame. Yeah. Like you were the number one player in high school football in the entire country. Nineteen class of ninety six. Yep. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we have that long to talk about it. Um, we might change positions, peaked out, uh, injuries, lack of focus, <laughs> school, not a lot of discipline. Um, it it uh it. A combination of a lot of things, but yeah, it, uh, I was a quarterback, wide receiver, safety in high school, and then um, I went to Stanford as a tight end. And the guys were better than me when I got there. I never played before, and and guys were better than me. Were you like good enough in high school where people were dropping bags off for you? Were you getting recruited like no. the sneaky ways? No, no, no. Um, we never got to that point. Did have a couple like it was it was um, it was right at the beginning of like caller ID. But, like, the old caller ID was, like, when you had the machine and it, you could tell it said the city under it. So it had the number and the city. So, like, there was these anonymous calls where you could tell it was coaches, but they were acting, like, shady, like, hey, is uh, anybody home? And I'm like, <laughs> what the heck is going? It's like, uh, you know, I won't say the, college, the, the hometowns of the colleges. But it was, it was pretty funny to hear guys try and start beating around the bush, like, trying, just trying to get any inside information. Uh, but uh, it was it was a long time ago. Yeah, it like, um, and it's there were no bags. There was no bags exchanged. Recruited at Notre Dame. Yeah, recruited Lou, at so, for Notre Dame. So Lou Holtz would like call you up and be like, "Oh, this is a must be the wrong number. Wait, wait a second. Is this Steve Coughlin? Let me talk to you for a second. Well, well, Lou couldn't get away with it because of, because of the voice, and the only person that could do Lou Holtz is Scott Van Pelt. So I knew it wasn't Lou. He had people do that. Uh, but yeah, Lou. I mean, that was actually the year he ended up uh, going. Uh, and, and, and leaving, um, they, Notre Dame was in a mess. I could tell I went to camp there before my senior year and you could just tell the coaching staff was in disarray. Um, and Notre Dame was a lot older of a campus than I really wanted to be around. So, uh, that's why I didn't, I didn't really like it. I mean, if you had had your career as Notre Dame, Steve, you'd be the biggest douchebag ever and no one would ever <laughs> Like it's having Notre Dame Steve on, I think I think it'd have to be Notre Dame Coughlin, Cough, right? Yeah, just yeah. brutal. We we don't want Notre mm. Dame Steve on. Um, no, I also I fucked up at the start. I should have said okay. last year Notre Dame Steve came on this show and gave us Baylor as the winner before the whole entire tournament started. So he needs he needs uh, a round of applause for that. He was okay. the one who gave us Baylor. So well, who's your who was your pick this year? I picked Villanova in the bracket, and then it took me all of two days to take Ohio State money line against them the other day. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> the bracket really loses credibility uh, in a matter of moments. I think I feel like everybody has their moment. Um, you know, I heard Jake talking on your last one just about how fast uh, you know the bracket was blown up on Thursday. But when you do have a good bracket, then you like it's something to hang on to, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah, but I got them in my bracket. All right, but what does that mean? Like, how much money can you win on the bracket? I'm. We want that instant cash, you know. Uh, listen, to, I, I'd love to get into PFT's talk. I mean, just hearing how many live bets you have put in on this tournament, <laughs> I'd love to know the percentage that you have hit. So my live bets are actually hitting at a much higher clip than the bets that I put in ahead of time. 
I'm like uh, locked in now. When so it comes, you're a gut guy. You're going with what you see with your gut. Yeah, and you're now, good to go. I'm not even counting. I mean, maybe if I, I should probably count these, but I'm not counting the like plus a thousand money line plays that I made. You know, uh, at, at nighttime, at the end of the day, just trying to find a win from TCU. That was I'm taking a flyer on those. Okay. But the ones that I'm doing after like five, six minutes, I bet a, a first half over, or I bet a second half spread. I'm I'm doing okay at those. So like. I was telling uh, Big Cat on on Friday after the first two days of the tournament, I bet on every single game and usually you know two to three times on every single game, and I ended up after the first two days exactly even from where I started, <laughs> and to me that's that is a massive win. I, yes. I essentially got two yes. days of fun for absolutely Huge. free. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like playing blackjack for like a you know five hours and you walk away with fifty bucks. You're like, you know what? That was still awesome. Oh, that's a, that's an incredible run. Yeah. I just can't get over the idea and the mindset. You guys, four straight days with all you knuckleheads together, just firing. Like that's gotta. There has to be some point where you're like, man, I really like something. But then everybody just talked me into this one. Damn, I was right. You know, you like know, it feels like, or you just get so drunk you don't remember those times. Yeah, the 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 only thing that happens with the um with the live streams, there are some group bets, but for me, it's personally just. By the end of the night, like Saturday and Sunday night, I looked and I just had like way too big of a bet on the last game. Like that Memphis Gonzaga <laughs> over I needed for my nutsack. Like the Arizona TCU I needed for my lungs. Like so that that's part of it. We responsibly gamble, but you you definitely get to a point where it's like, oh, there's only one game left. Let's let's fire a nuke at this yeah. game and hope it works out. So uh let's talk about this sweet sixteen though. So yeah. I, I well, I mean, the Thursday games are incredible. Let's start with Unbelievable. actually. Unbelievable. Yeah, incredible games. Let's start with Texas Tech Duke. I yeah. want to bet on Texas Tech very badly. My problem is, and I said this before the tournament, this is the game that the refs dictate how Texas Tech plays defense because we know they're very aggressive. And if, mm -hmm. if Duke's going to get a whistle at any point in the tournament, it's this game, and that's the thing. Do you think it's crazy to hold back because of that? I can see where you're coming from. To me, being a Duke fan that I am, this game really reminds me of 2009 when Villanova finally broke through and beat Duke for the first time in 50 years. And they did it because they just just crushed them defensively. And that's what really worries me for Duke in this situation is the youth they have and just the ultimate tough guy mentality that Texas Tech plays with. Like, they are not going to get bullied. I see what you're saying with the whistle. I understand a lot of people start watching college basketball for the first time in March and say the refs suck. The refs suck in every sport. Like, give me a sport where they're good, all right? Maybe hockey because you don't notice them. Uh, but I, I really like Texas Tech in this situation because of the experience, toughness, and I think they could just make make Duke crumble uh, being with the youth and in, 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 in experience. You know what it is in college basketball? The ref, You're right. The refs suck everywhere. I think they definitely suck in college basketball for two reasons. One is a, a charge call is hard to figure out game to game. And two, it's actually not on the refs. It's on the coaches. Coaches coaching so scared when a guy gets two fouls. Like, even in the Memphis game that I just talked about, Memphis, there's like five minutes left and both of their bigs are on the bench because they have four fouls. Yeah. What are we What are we saving them for? Like, that, and you'll see a guy get two fouls. I get it. You don't want him to get his third, but... Like, even Wisconsin on against Iowa State, Wall gets his second foul like five minutes in the game, doesn't play the rest of the half. That makes no sense to me that you, like, you have to you have to trust your players at some point. So I think that part, people complain about the rest, but it's really the coaches not being able to, to figure out how to manage their players better. I have, a re I have a theory that could help all, especially the block charge in college basketball. Next year, the refs should just call every block charge a block. But don't tell anybody they're doing it, and then people will stop trying to take them, and then we're good. Yeah, and also an easy fix for college basketball. They should add a sixth foul, and if you think like, oh, because the game is shorter, that's fine. Make the fifth foul be like – or make the sixth foul be automatic, you know, two shots of the ball or something like that. You know what I mean? You can add a penalty yeah. to it, but at least – I always go back. The, the most memorable time when I was like, fuck these rules was Florida-Ohio State National Championship. When Joe Kim Noah and Greg Oden both didn't play in the first half because they got two fouls, it's like, what are we watching this for? What are yeah. we watching this for? That was brutal. Brutal. Yeah. Was so, there. all right. So you're you're on Duke in this game, or no? You're on Texas no, Tech. No, Texas Tech for sure. Okay. 
All right, uh, the Villanova. You mentioned Villanova. They're your national champion. I, Michigan's yeah. a great story. Juwan Howard tried to hug that guy to death, that kid. Um, I just think Villanova, like, they're the most dependable tournament team year in and year out where even that Ohio State game, Ohio State gets it close, and it's like, guess what Villanova does? They make all their free throws. They never, ever waver. They're so, so dependable. Who do you have in that one? I, I look at the points with Michigan because I do think the size will hurt Villanova. The problem is how will Michigan defend the, that five-out offense where Villanova just throws every guy outside the three-point line and just throws it around until they get the matchup they want, and that guy goes to the hoop. Obviously, they'll try and put Dickinson on an island. Uh, you mentioned the free throws. We have two things I think that are interesting in this term. We have the best free throw shooting team in Villanova, and then Arkansas is a team who has taken – the most and made the most free throws. So that's something to keep an eye on when we're talking point spreads because you always like to have those sides. But I think the discipline of Villanova and knowing that they, they just, like you said, they just always end up with the ball in the guys in the right guy's hands when you need it most. You know, they cut it to two and then right down, um, they, they, they get a three-point bucket to go up five right away and take all the momentum out of Ohio State. So I, I think I have to trust Villanova in this situation, but with the points, you know, I think it's around five or so. I think I would take Michigan because I think it's not going to be. I think it's going to be that close to the game. So Michigan just beat uh, Tennessee. If you're a Tennessee yeah. fan, they you could say that they overachieved to a certain extent during the season this year. Like they're yeah. they were a great team uh, during the regular season and obviously during the during the SEC tournament. Are you happy with Rick Barnes, or are you at a point where you're like, I can't stand this guy in March? Uh, I go, I, I'm a guy where I don't judge a, uh, judge a coach on, on his success in March. Uh, I, I don't think it's fair. I think it's that crazy of a tournament. Like, you know, Matt Painter's still alive. Plenty has been made about him, uh, in, in his, you know, tenure as at Purdue because of what his teams have not done in March. But then I go back and look like, I remember in a sweet 16 game like, like this, he played Duke and he lost in that game. Duke won the national championship that year. A couple of years ago, think about the Virginia game. They're that close. That team could win a national title, and a buzzer shot goes off, and they lose. Like, that team was that – like, it had that trajectory going. But that's how fast it ends up in March. So, with Rick Barnes, I, I, I do – I know everybody's going to throw the point spread uh, and how what his record is against the point spread, but his teams get after – they shot 2 of 18, I believe, from three. That's why they lost. And that's what, that's what has to happen in March. You have to avoid those games. You have to avoid those games. And you have to avoid the games where your opponent makes 15 threes. And sometimes you just can't do it. You know, it's against you. But uh, what did you guys say last week? 25 and 25, that's his record? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, even I, when he had KD and, and DJ Augustine, didn't do anything. Like, it, it, it's, it's but he fun. Had for one year. He had one year, and it was one game, and they got they got beat by USC and Tim Floyd. He's a pretty good I, player. He, he, I, just, I think it's not – so you're, you're right. I, I totally agree. Like, judging it on the tournament, the tournament's so fucking difficult. That's why I always say if you have a team in the tournament, you win one game, celebrate, because it's, it's hard to do. I do think there's something to be said about – there's not a knock on Rick Barnes, but other coaches are just built better for in-game adjustments, for the tournament setting, for the quick turnaround. Like, I look at a guy like Mick Cronin. I think he does an unbelievable job in-game. Oh, of, yeah. of making oh, yeah. adjustments where there's some teams who let's roll it out and let's run our system and hope it works. And sometimes it won't. Well, the, the problem with Tennessee uh, PFT, I remember we were talking about this last year when you guys had me on and you were all in on Illinois. You saw them win the big 10 tournament. They were rolling. And that's why I always with the bracket and everything, I try and avoid those red hot teams. And Tennessee was one of them. Everybody was bitching about their seed. They should have been a two. They should have had Duke's line. But then when I looked at them, like they kind of got a better draw than Duke, I thought. Uh, I, 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 you know, the way they were playing and all that. So it's just amazing how it always lines up. And when it is your team and you had a lack of success and not getting to a Final Four in a while, yeah, I, I could see it eating at you very easily. The, yeah, the Illinois thing's a perfect example too because I, I know a lot of Illinois fans are saying like Brad Underwood, they have questions now. Illinois mm -hmm. got a draw last year where they played like a top top 10 Ken Palm team in Illinois, Chicago. They got a draw this year where they, the five seed in their region is Houston, which by all metrics is like the fourth best team in the country. That's just, <laughs> that's just really shitty luck. You know what I mean? Like it, it, you could, you could argue that, you know, Brad Underwood could have done a better job, but they basically got the worst possible draw two years in a row for their second round matchup. 
Totally agree. And I just, you know, you watch them all the time, uh, Big Cat. And, and it's like, it, Illinois, their good was awesome, but their bad was just like, how did they lose this game? I th- right. You know, and it just, they're just so inconsistent. And who was on the floor at what time? It was just, it was just weird to watch all year. And that's why I didn't, I didn't like them, especially going against Houston, uh, knowing that the men that they have, I mean, they, they'll, you- They'll try and suffocate. Man. You love Houston. I know I, you have to love Houston because you're a guy who, like, when it all you're, – you're very smart about football and basketball handicapping, but when it's all said and done, you're the type of guy who likes to go on the court or the field before the game and just, like, size up some dudes and be like, yeah, <laughs> those guys are just bigger and stronger and they want it more. Well, I just I, – I like the persona of Kelvin Sampson. Like, he brought it up, like, three times in every interview during the game – about how they got screwed because they played the last game for what was it Thursday night or Friday night? Friday night? Friday night, yeah. Friday night and then they played the first game Sunday. Like he just kept bringing it up every time <laughs> and you could tell he told his team like fuck this, we're going to win this game. Like I don't I don't want any excuses. Let's take this as motivation and go and you know they Coburn was done by the 10 minute mark of the second half. He it was amazing how hard Houston made him work to post up and I just thought it was funny like Reggie Miller and Bonner are on the call and they're like gotta get the ball to Coburn here gotta get the ball like every possession they said get the ball to Coburn and the lead is just increasing because Houston was making shots on the other end and when they do that they're as tough as there as there is I I like Houston this game too because I feel like uh Arizona you know they just got done playing TCU now they're playing yeah. Houston those are two of the same exact types of teams that are just yeah. going to beat the shit out of you for a while. So nothing was easy for them against TCU. It was a really physical game. They're exhausted from that, and now they have to go up against Houston right now. I love Houston. That's the uh, that's the late game, right? Yes. Yeah, I love Houston that late game. I I, I, li- I look at Houston. I'm not sure Arizona, like Arizona, first year head coach, awesome success. Benedict Math- Matherin is my favorite player in college basketball. Um, I, I I just I just love everything he brings to the table. But the versatility Houston has to defend, and the and they have multiple bigs that they that you need against Arizona. That's what makes Arizona, from a matchup standpoint, has everything. But Houston has a lot of versatility where they could switch off the guys. Uh, Arizona makes their living with that high low game. You'll see Coloco come out, dump it down, or really the other guy, and he dumps it down to Coloco, who had an unbelievable first half against TCU. But I think TCU found something in the Arizona defense where there was a lack of switching going on. Uh, late in that game, you, you kept seeing them go pick and roll, and they were just trying to find the right matchup with it. So I'm interested. If Houston can make shots, uh, they'll they'll win this game. I'm just not sure they can make as many shots to keep up uh, with Arizona. But I, I would lean Houston in this game. And uh, Gonzaga, Arkansas, how many foul shots is Drew Timmy going to miss for me? <laughs> well, here this one, like, I mean, you guys know Mus. I we talked. Every goes on all the everybody's shows like. No one, no one loves being the underdog more than Mus, right? Like you watch him coach against Vermont and New Mexico State, and you could just see the tension. Like him being a favorite, he couldn't stand it because you know. Then you then you factor in the the ugliness of the game and how the, those other two teams were dictating tempo, and it got sort of sort of hazy there. Like that stuff drains him. And now, like this week, he's a nine point underdog. He's probably watching. You know, his team's probably watching Hoosiers. He's got every underdog story (laughs) in the world going like, you know, everything's pinned up in the locker room, Uh, multiple underdog stories on the flight out uh, to San Francisco. So I look at Arkansas as playing a lot looser and free uh, in this game as an R and Gonzaga is, you know, you got, you saw what Memphis, you have to make shots against them because they are going to come out and and, and put the ball in the basket. Uh, I was blown away with Nebhard, the point guard for, for Gonzaga to play 40 minutes and then go make four or four free throws in the last 25 seconds, like that stuff, that that's impressive stuff, man. Mm-hmm. And that's why, every, you know, to everybody talks about Timmy, I think it's a huge game for Chet uh, because this is, you know, every, you know, who has the pros, right, in the Sweet 16? Who's got more pros? You're going to hear people say, oh, give me the team with more pros. This is a game where Chet has to stick out uh, because Arkansas has multiple bigs that they could put on him. And when you watch – Gonzaga this year, when they've had problem against Duke, against St. Mary's, it's been teams that have multiple bigs to match up with Timmy and Chet. Uh, just kind of offset it. Even if it's just scoring on the other end, 
and making them work on the other end. So Arkansas has that. Um, I just don't know if Arkansas can make enough threes. Uh, we know they'll get in transition. We know they're going to go to the free throw line. But can they make enough threes? I, I'm not, I don't think so to win the game, but I like them to keep it close and cover the spread. We need, we need a J.D. Note game. You need a J.D. Note game because yeah. he hasn't had yep. it. He hey, hasn't had it. Where's this game being played? That game is going to be San played Francisco. in San Francisco. Okay, yeah. so it's not in Buffalo. I heard, by the way, that the gym was cold <laughs> yeah, in Buffalo. Oh. Yeah. And so that's why everybody was missing. Either that or maybe maybe Musbus was just like, you know what, I'm sick of being favored in a game. I'm going to make sure that we win this game but look really pathetic doing it offensively. So that way we're <laughs> definitely going to be underdogs in the next round. Yeah. Uh, you could just – I mean, his face during the game and then the release – when he's cheering at the crowd after the game is, is only what he could do. It's, it's has, it, to see. has anybody recovered from shoulder surgery faster than Eric Musselman? No. Like he's his hands are just like full range of motion right now. He's the yeah, best. He'll be, he'll, he's probably diving in practice. Yeah, yeah. he definitely <laughs> is. Loose ball, um, loose ball drill. All right, so Friday's not as great of a slate just in terms of uh, names, but just give me your best bet on Friday because we'll everything will change. You, you know, you got to bet on Thursday and then – you know, once we get through Thursday, then you got to readjust. Uh, the famous story is always when when Steve, we, he was out to dinner with us in Madison a couple of years ago, and I stood up from the table, from the dinner table, to go try to get a bet in for like a, I think it was like. It was a third bet on a Friday night college football. It was, I, mean, I think it was on. like FIU versus someone. It was, I got fucked with the, they returned an onside kick to fuck me. And Steve just goes. <laughs> You don't have to bet every game, and and Dave and I just look at him like, yeah, you do. So yeah, yeah. But you a, you a, select in a, in a room that you guys are taking care of things, and I'm like, wow, I feel pretty small right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so give us your best bet for Friday, knowing that you don't have to bet every game. Here it's it's um, I'm dying to see how Mick Cronin takes advantage of North Carolina's lack of defense, right? He's done it. Like I remember last year in Sweet, I think it was Sweet 16 against Michigan. Like Michigan looked like the best team in the country uh, on that roll when they had Wagner and all those guys going. And then UCLA just diced them up, mucked it up, and and they advanced. Can he get like Baycott to come out and and, and get you know Hawkes going inside? You know he, he'll have a game plan. I just I'm dying to see what it is. The problem is is I don't think UCLA makes enough threes. And Carolina when they got it going. They're as good as, as Arizona or Gonzaga offensively, at least when I watch them. I mean, Manich, you know, I, he might be having the best run going of anybody in the tournament, and he lost 10 minutes because he threw an elbow. Uh, but shooting-wise, they're as good as anybody. And the problem with UCLA is when they miss, they're not getting rebounds. UCLA, I mean, I think I saw they have, like, over 40 rebounds in five of the last seven games. Like, that's nuts. And UCLA doesn't have the biggest guys. So UCLA has to shoot, I'd say, over 50, 52%, something like that. I'm not sure they can. Uh, so I would take North Carolina in that game. Okay. All right. And then the last thing, we got to talk about New Orleans. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. I got a bunch of things we got to get to her. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, you bunch start. I mean, we got to do a date. We're going to do a, a yep. mandate. I think we are going to try to set it up. So if anyone in New Orleans listening to this right now, has their best wings. Like, I'm not talking about your favorite. I'm saying the wings that will blow you away. We need that recommendation, and we need it soon because I think the plan is we're going to bring the podcasting equipment to a wing place, Ooh. and we're going to have a, a wing date with Titus and you and me and PFT, and then we'll podcast after, and it will be great, but we need the best possible wing place people can come up with. And I don't want peanut butter and jelly wings and all that type of stuff. I want buffalo wings. <laughs> yes, right? Yes. BFT, you're with me with that? I'm, yes. I'm with I want you. buffalo sauce. I, I, like, I like a little variety from time to time if there's like a dry rub or a smoked barbecue option. But for this okay. instance, I, I you're right. I'm looking for hot wings. Hot chicken wings, go. cold beer. It's not rocket science. The best you no, got in New Orleans. I know you got the cold beer. Show me where the wings are. I'm very much looking forward to this. I've I've... Been looking forward to this honestly for the last what three years. When yeah. when was the first wing date when I was doing ecstasy you, in was, Hong Kong? It was Minnesota, Minneapolis. So, yeah, Minneapolis. Minneapolis. It was yeah, and date yeah. and Steve and I went on the date just the two of us, and it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It was a great wing place. <laughs> also, yeah. I think uh, last time we we're in New Orleans, I I tried to wrestle Stanford Steve. Uh, that's, you, that, that's what I wanted to bring up right here. Let's okay, start right there. We are going back to New Orleans for the scene of the crime. Was 
I believe it was like 20 minutes to a half hour before you guys did those award-winning interviews with Joe Burrow and, and Coach <laughs> O. I think it was like a half hour before that. Uh, PFT standing in the middle of Bourbon Street, challenging me to a three-point stance right in the middle, <laughs> and it was a beautiful thing. Beautiful yeah, thing. You didn't want any. And we're, we're going back there. No, I, I didn't. I didn't like your chances. And at that state, you had gotten a way. I had to do things post game. You had a way uh, more of a head start on me. Uh, I'll just say that. Um, and so, it was uh, it was we, quite a crew too. I think it was like oh. it was us. I think Chris Long, Rosillo, Anthony Rizzo was with us. I think Cutler was with us for a little bit too. It was a hodgepodge of a crew just blacked out on Bourbon. You know what it was? Now that I'm remembering the crew. It was the fact that I was literally standing around everyone who was six foot three. <laughs> everyone except for me in that group was six foot three and probably in the two thirty to two ninety range. And so at that point I'm like, I gotta do something about this, show I belong. I know. I'm gonna push yeah, the biggest guy in the Steve. prison yard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll do it again. Uh, we'll have a rematch. All right. You got yeah. it. Uh, yeah, so for the Wings, I'm sure, you know, with the popularity of you guys, people are going to reach out. But it, like you said, BFT, it doesn't have to be crazy, simple Buffalo. Because I'm a guy, when I go out for Wings, they ask for ranch or blue cheese, I say more Buffalo sauce. That's just me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Extra sauce to dip it in. I love it. I'm so excited for this trip. Um, all right, well, so, I, yeah, how what do you say? Think Titus, how do you think Titus is going to do? He's intimidated right I, now. I, I think we have to be nurturing. He's like a here, like a shy dog that you have to invite over by sticking the back of your hand out and letting them smell that and come to you. Because he's he's intimidated by the fact that he is accepting a wing date right yeah, now. Yeah, I think he's going to do fine. I think afterwards he's probably going to like puke his guts out just out of nerves and wings and be like, I'll never yeah. do that again. Like, I hope those guys liked me. <laughs> but, uh, well. Yeah, it's just weird, like, because I've been thinking about, like, he and I are, like, almost complete opposites, right? <laughs> like, I just, like, he's skinny, I'm not, you know, he was he's a good shooter. I didn't make, I think I made two threes in my high school career. Um, I don't know, it's just every, every kind of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, cat, like, he likes tofu burgers, I like cheeseburgers. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just, I don't know how it's going to mix, like, it's never really happened before, so. It'd be I, fun to find out. It would be. I just imagine him like bringing like a note card of like talking points, and then going to the bathroom over and over, and being like, "Wait, is he doing coke right now? No, he's just trying to find. He's just trying to find topics that guys like to talk about." You know what this is? This is like you and you and Mark Titus together are like, "I love you, man." <laughs> You're teaching him how to become a bro. Okay. Pulling him out of his, pulling him out of that that uh, clean cut shell a little bit. Yeah, it'll be yeah, fun though. I, mean, I think I think wings are the, the great equalizer. We'll uh, we'll there have you a, go. a good yeah. session afterwards. We'll be dealing with it'll be maybe the most heartburn in any single podcast afterwards. Yes, yeah. We should uh, Tom should probably sponsor it. Um, speaking of wings, I don't think your producer should be invited for his performance of the last time we had wings. Oh, our our intern Billy. Yes. Yeah. Oh no, I, Hank. I mean, oh, Hank just popped in. Do you think Hank should be invited? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Hank, okay. Right, sure. Yeah, you that's love. Yeah, Billy. you. Steve and Hank get along very well. Billy's not invited, so that's good. Billy's not a producer. Yeah, in any sense of the word, he doesn't. He doesn't <laughs> even produce work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, that produces was, excuses. Yeah, so he's a producer <laughs> oh, of excuses. Okay. So Steve was so upset at Billy uh, when we went on the road to the Super Bowl and we tried the seventy-two ounce challenge. We went to that Amarillo Steakhouse. When Steve saw Billy's performance, he was fucking disgusted well, with it. Like, well, just ashamed that Billy was that he, that Steve had to call himself the same species as Billy. Remember, it started too with the hot wings yes. in yeah the, on the saying. Grit Week yes. when he was sitting with us and he watched it firsthand and was like, "Is this guy serious? All this hype, and he gets one wing down." Do you have any recommendations for Billy as how he can improve his eating? Yeah, I'd like to see him. Just, I just want to see. How many McDonald's cheeseburgers he can eat in an hour? Whoa, Billy, what do you think? Um, I, pr I think I could definitely get over one well, an hour. <laughs> Double digits would probably be the over under. Ten. Ten? Yeah. Oh, you've got to eat more than ten. <laughs> <laughs> He's already disappointed. What? No, let's flip it back. Steve, you eat, you eat two at a time. You eat two at a time at, for every fifteen minutes. Come on. 
I'm trying to get the sizing <laughs> wait, of the average wait, wait. cheeseburger. Steve. They're tiny. Steve, tell us. Yeah. You give us the number that would get you to respect Billy again. He's thinking. Uh, 14. Okay. So there it is. If he eats 14 cheeseburgers in an hour from McDonald's, you have Stanford Steve's respect. Steve's really just seen me at my worst. So like, I mean, when I can't, when I, would you like I, him I to need, see that? I need to just, <laughs> when, I, I when think, do you think I might have to take that one on. What, what instance uh, do you think that Steve should see you in to make him impressed with you? That's a very good question. It's <laughs> yeah. a very, very good question. When I'm in my element. Yeah. When you go, unlike the last several times, actually, Billy, if you can do 14, we should do a video. Billy attempts another food challenge, trying to Dude, earn, earn a man's respect. I'm not respect. even a competitive eater. It's just like I put myself in these well, situations. Yeah, you can't, you can't be a competitive eater when you're going to eat for all you can eat steak. And I see you drinking steins of beer before. <laughs> like you can't. That's not yeah. going to add up. And you saw how that ended. I it didn't. Uh, you know, as a compet not a competitive eater, uh, I would have known that the car the carbon monoc uh, carbon dioxide. Yeah. <laughs> Build up in your stomach really is Jesus. not conducive. You get to, really uh, scientific with it when yeah. your when your response should just be like, "Yeah, I shouldn't have gotten loaded at nine thirty in the morning before I tried to eat a steak." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe don't do that. But if uh, I had finished it, it would have been sick. It would have been. It would have been legendary. A lot of people have finished it just straight up, no beer. Yes, Billy, that's I, the point. If finishing you had, it, if you had finished beer, it, it would have been better. But than there's you not so many it. YouTube videos of people just finishing it with no beer and like water. It's great too that we're now just totally dismissing the part. The wing thing was the worst. Well, that you did I mean, one wing. You that, didn't even do bad. one. Yes, that was bad. Yeah, yeah. I that was, was. I think I was set up. I think there's gasoline in those. Yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> All right, well, Steve, we're looking forward to New Orleans. We appreciate you coming on. Oh, wait, one last thing. St. Peter's Purdue. Tell me a reason why, like, give me a reason why I should be able to lie to myself about betting on St. Peter's. Because I'm going to do it, but just give me a reason to make myself feel okay about doing it. Yeah, I, I saw a stat, because I remember, I think I bet against both of the ones that happened. The la There's been two 15 seeds to go to the Sweet 16, or, uh, yeah, to the Sweet yes. 16. The last one was Gulf Coast. And no, then Oral Roberts oh, last no, year. Or yeah, yeah, Oral and Gulf Coast. And um, they both lost, but they both covered double digits, I believe. There's that, that, that's what the stat was. Oh, okay. So, um, lean St. Peter's. Yeah, Good. love it. Love it. I um, just can't wait to see Edie against that team. Yeah. Like, Edie <laughs> against the, against the team, uh, uh, St. Peter's, it, it, it's just going to be – Funny to see. Edie it, against Doug, yeah. yeah. So we, I'll yeah. tell you already what's going to happen. Uh, Hank's going to bet money line on St. Peter's. If I bet money line on St. Peter's, they're going to lose. If me okay. and Big Cat don't bet money line on St. Peter's and Hank's the only one that they're does, gonna they're going to win, and then Hank's going to walk around strutting. Peacock. Hey, he's going to be a peacock. peacock. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Well, tell Hank I miss him. Go do. Stanford Steve was brought to you by our friends over at Body Armor. You can find Body Armor Edge at your local 7-Eleven, or you can order it on Amazon. We were drinking Body Armor Edge. You saw us on the live stream. It's the brand new flavors that are doing it for me. This was it the Strawberry Splash. Is that the one that they had that I liked so much this weekend? It's awesome. It's a great drink. It's perfect for when you're watching games on TV. The big tournaments here, we're staying hydrated and energized with the Body Armor Edge. It's from the makers of our favorite sports drink. Body Armor Edge has 100 milligrams of caffeine and 1,000 milligrams of electrolytes to keep you going through another crazy tournament. It's got antioxidants. It's got B vitamins and no artificial sweeteners, flavors, or dyes. It's more than just a sports drink. It's Body Armor Edge. The two new flavors. It's Strawberry Slam. That's what it was. Strawberry Slam and Watermelon Wave are delicious. They're awesome new flavors. You can push through the highs and the lows of the tournament with our favorite sports drink and caffeine. That's Body Armor Edge. Body Armor Edge, available at 7-Eleven, or you can find it online on Amazon. Now here is Tom Crean. Okay, we now welcome on our good friend. Haven't talked to him in a while. It is Coach Tom Crean. He is currently a free agent. We're going to get him a job, or if he wants to be back in the media because he excelled at that, Maybe that too, Coach. How are we feeling? I feel good. It's great to be with you guys. I mean, I've been looking forward to it. Yeah, it's um, it's great to see you. Uh, we're gonna talk some ball, but first, what you know, obviously things didn't go great at the end in, in, in Georgia, but 
what, what are we thinking going forward? I mean, you were incredible on, on TV, but I know that your passion is always to coach. Um, you give us the marching orders and we'll, and we'll, we'll take them and we'll, we'll, we'll push it whichever way you want. Well, I'm bored to death and, and lately, and that's that outside of seeing some basketball, I saw Duke Michigan state the other day. I saw some practices. I'm going to go to a G league game tonight. I mean, I definitely want to get back to work. Um, I definitely want to coach. I mean, you can't have the, the, the season that we had and not want to get back. We had so many things going in the right direction, COVID hits and it affects everybody. Uh, it affected us in a big way. Um, we had some transfers and we had some injuries this past year. Uh, we had some close games, but we just couldn't get over the hump. We could never get traction. So like, I want to get in a situation where we're doing that again, but, but at the same time, I enjoy TV. I mean, I enjoy uh, like right now, like I'm watching tape, like I'm preparing for the games, right. In the, in the sense of the sweet 16 teams. And just to keep yourself fresh, you learn things, you, you have a notebook for how you would defend somebody, you have a notebook for uh, all the things that you like, that you see. And so I'm trying to stay real well versed in that. So I'm for best option available right now. That, that's that, that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to choose the best player available in the draft. Right, I want the best option available. Yeah, well, you just get some hats out on a table so you can pick the one and be like, pick up the CBS one or the Fox one. Like, I'm back, guys. Have you given any thought whatsoever to maybe NBA, maybe doing something at the pro level? I have. I mean, I think, I think, um, I mean, I love the pro level. And uh, in the past, I've had a couple chances to interview for head jobs. And early on in my career, I had a couple chances as an assistant. But I haven't given it a lot of thought as actually that be in the career path. I mean, I'd be open to that. But at the same time, I enjoy being a head coach. And and uh, but I do I do love the NBA. Like I'm going to get to the G League game today, College Park in Maine. Get there early with my son and and uh, a guy in my staff, David Gale, and like just watch like how they train people. Because my son Riley was with me for the last three years. He gave up baseball after his first year here to coach. And I know he wants, you know, he's 22, he's graduating in May, and I know he truly wants to get back into it. And you couldn't have a much bigger fan. I know you've got a lot of fans, but Riley's in that fan group either, if you remember meeting him a couple of years yes, ago. Yes, yes, so, yeah. But uh, he still wears his shirts. But uh, to me, I, I love the game, right? I love coaching it. I love the practice and the development part of it. And, again, after a year like now, like – I mean, if they make a call at the end of the game, we we have a chance to beat Auburn at our place, and they're number one in the country. I mean, in 22 years, I've never been a part of a of a worse non call. Like I'd have slept better um, knowing they called a blocking foul at the end of the game, where it really should have been a travel and then a charge. It's kind of like what probably what Jamie Dixon's dealing with right now after the game the other day. I mean, call over and back, call something, but right. blow the mm -hmm. whistle at the end of the game so it doesn't come down to it the way that it does. But there's always those moments that keep driving you competitively that you want to get back at it. So I really am pretty open on it. And and th th that's the most important thing for me is just to kind of take it unemotionally uh, and and really, really look at it uh, in a good way. And, th and there's things we're going to do different this time, again, even from the beginning when it comes to choosing a job. The, and I think those those are really, really crucial. Yeah, I mean, you, and, you you answered the question, by the way, when you said you're going to a G League game tonight. That was like, <laughs> that was it right there. That That's how much you love ball right there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I, you learn from so many areas. I went to one last week. I mean, I learned a ton. And I love it. I mean, I just lo I love studying the game. Yeah. So let's talk about this Sweet 16. You said you were watching, taking notes. What high high level, like, which team do you think right now poses the, mu the most matchup problems for the rest of the field going through the Sweet 16, Elite Eight, Final Four? For the rest of the field, I would say I'll go with Kansas because I think they have so many guys that can beat you. And, and and they can defend. I mean, they, they can really defend. And they can keep you off the foul line. I mean, they're not – in this tournament, being deep is is not overly important because of the length of the timeouts. And, and, and guys that get used to playing a lot of minutes uh, are pretty well conditioned to it at this point. So, like, those long TV timeouts seem like an eternity for guys. And I think you can play a smaller amount of players and and, and really not lose a lot. You know, the, the problem in this tournament is what's going to come down to in so many ways 
is a turnover battle and the free throw battle, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you're giving up an inordinate amount of points off turnovers, uh, it's going to be a problem. And 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 the, the trick is, if you've been low on turnovers during the year, can you stay in character during this? Well, it's the same thing. It's the same thing with the foul line. So like, there's teams right now that would really make me nervous in a in a in a really close game, last two three minutes, where they've got to go put the game away at the foul line. And and there's also some teams that are they going to can are they going to Im, impose their will enough to make sure like their that their strength is getting to the foul line. Yeah. Right? Like Arkansas strength is getting to the foul line. Well, Gonzaga doesn't put you on the foul line very much. But at the same time, if you put Gonzaga at the foul line, Timmy uh, and and Holmgren are very, very average free throw shooters. And and like, are you going to force them to foul during the game? Because Timmy doesn't get called for many fouls, neither does Holmgren. But at the end of the game, okay, can you trust them to go and make the foul shot? So, like, the closer you can keep it inside of these games, the better it's going to be. And I say that because I think Kansas has got some real spurt ability to where they can knock you out because they've got such quickness, they've got such speed, they don't have to rely on any one aspect of the game to beat you offensively. And defensively, they can really, really lock you down, especially from three. That's a good answer because mm -hmm. I think they're kind of the forgotten, you know, team right now where it's a lot of Gonzaga, a lot of Duke, a lot of, you know, UNC, UCLA, and Villanova back in the mix. Uh, but Kansas has, probably has the easiest draw remaining in terms of their, their region, and they have been playing great basketball. Yeah, and Coach, which one of these coaches that's remaining right now would you uh, – would you expect to be the one that's most likely to come out there with something unusual, something creative uh, offensively that we haven't seen yet? Like who's, which one of these coaches is always a guy that's like looking for a new wrinkle that would debut it in a time like this during the sweet 16? Oh, it, there's no question. It's Eric Musselman and, and it's Eric Musselman versus the field. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he's, he, he's very unique. I mean, he, he's going to find different ways to guard you and they don't panic. That's the thing about Arkansas. I mean, Note is not shooting the ball real well. I think in, in our league, in the SEC, there was only one game he wasn't in double figures, and it was when they got beat by Texas A&M in the SEC tournament. Well, they're not shooting it great, but at the same time, they're finding ways to win. They get fouled. I mean, he's going to find ways. He's not relying on the three. And if they were, they wouldn't win because they're not shooting the three nearly as well. Now, Stan Lumidi is is the guy – that I think is an X factor for them to shoot the ball. And 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 I think what, what Eric's going to do is find ways to not only get him open on the break, but get him open in the half court. But not only what they can do offensively to get fouled, but what they can bring at you defensively to disrupt you. And I think that's where the background with his dad all those years of being such an innovative coach, what he's done, whether it's the G League, the NBA, with Nevada, Arkansas, what he's done as an innovative coach is, is a big thing in this tournament because – you know, your nerves are so open for uh, interpretation inside of this game. Like this, this whole thing comes down to mental toughness and you start getting nervous and uptight and you miss shots. And all of a sudden you start seeing ghosts and your shoulders get tight and you start forcing the action or you start getting quiet or you lose your awareness on defense. And all of a sudden that's where the game is. And I think what Eric's done with this team, with the way that they played in the SEC is they've overcome a lot of that. And I think they're going to have to against Gonzaga because you're going to have to go right at Gonzaga. They don't get called for a lot of fouls. I think Timmy's averaging like two fouls per 40 minutes. Like, I, I don't know how you do that, but like you got to go at them. Like you got to go at North Carolina because they don't commit a lot of fouls. So the teams that are innovative, creative, go after you, post it up, put you in pick and roll, lift your bigs out of the lane. Those are the things that are going to be separators in this tournament. Those are parts of the game within the game, I think. And yeah. conversely, which one of the coaches would you trust the most in terms of in-game adjustments? Um, it's a good question. I think I think I Thank think you. Bill Self is right there. Uh, no question about it. Um, I think Mike K. I mean, being at that game the other day. It was one of the most intense atmospheres I've ever been at is, is somebody sitting in the stands. I mean, the tension in that building in the last five, six, seven minutes was unbelievable. But he got that team settled in. And Michigan State played into it a little bit. It was 74-73. A.J. Hoggard, uh, Hoggard drives it, gets it blocked. They come down, they give up a bucket. Now they're down one. Joey Hauser comes in and gets it blocked. Well, that's the game. And then Hoggard comes down on the other end, goes for a steal. All right, they get a back cut. They get a layup. It changes the whole game. Well, 
Mike made the adjustments inside of that game of, 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 of really letting Roach get going and, and really get the ball reversed. And Paulo was such a good passer inside of that game. He created so much offense for them. And, and I think guys like that, that aren't reliant on one way to beat you. The teams that are overly reliant on three, like I like Villanova in this tournament, but like they really, really need to make threes. Mm. And really very few people have taken them away from it. Yeah. I like well, how he called him Mike K there. For a second, I was like, wait, are you talking about the, the radio host? <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, just go with, we'll go with Mike Krzyzewski. Yeah, yeah. You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't call him coach? Do you call other coaches coach? Oh, I call him coach. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, because, because um, and he's been great to me since this happened. I've had some guys that have just been fantastic, and he's been one of them. And, and, but no, when I first met him, I think I was like 20 years of age. So he was coach then, he's coach now. Got guys deserve that. I, I'm not one of those guys that overly call people coach or coacher or, you know, all that cliche stuff, but he deserves coach. There's no doubt about that. Uh, you mentioned the threes. This is a, maybe a dumb question, but if you're a team, if you go into a game with your team and you're shooting very poorly from three in that game, do you ever do you tell your team to adjust and stop taking threes, or are you of the mindset of like you just got to keep shooting? We'll knock a couple down uh, because I always like that's the tournament. Sometimes like you catch a team when they're hot and you're not, or vice versa, and it can be over. Well, it's two things. First off, you don't you don't you don't want them taking challenge threes, and most of the good three point shooting teams like Villanova is a great example. Uh, they really move the ball right, like they make the next pass. So like this this tournament, and we saw this the other day, I, I thought Duke's length bothered Michigan State. And and when Michigan State started to make some open jump shots, started to get out on the break, the game changed for them. But when they were trying to make plays at the rim, when they were trying to shoot pull-ups, it, it's amazing how the length changes the game. And, 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 and again, small guards can sometimes be a problem in this. Like I didn't think Auburn had a ton of energy in the game the other day, Walker Kessler got in foul trouble and Bruce sat him down early. They took some bad shots, but small guards were a problem for Miami and the fact that Miami could get whatever they wanted on the offensive end. But I don't think you stop your team from shooting it. I think you control the game more with trying to make sure you're getting something inside. When that thing gets to five team fouls, and this is one of the things that makes Mike Krzyzewski so good. When that thing gets to five team fouls in, in the half, I mean, they are going inside. Yeah. So, like, if your team doesn't have awareness, situational awareness of where the bonus is, or if you're not cognizant as a coach, when that thing gets to three and four, how do we get to five and six? When it gets to five, how do we get to seven? When it gets to seven and eight, how do we get to ten so we get to two shots? Well, you're doing your team a disservice. And, and when you can get into the bonus, and I think this is something to really watch, when teams are in the bonus somewhere around the 12 – minute mark, 11 minute mark, 10 minute mark, like you're not gonna probably lose. Right. Unless you're a really, really poor free throw shooting team. So you want your team to play with freedom. You want it to get reversed. You want them to get driving kicks, make the next pass, but you better have a plan for how you're gonna get fouled, whether it's on the drive or whether it's on the post up. And, and with that being said, that's why Purdue is such a dangerous mm -hmm. team because they score from two, they score from three, the offensive rebound, Zach Eady is the number one offensive rebound percentage guy in the country. Trayvon Williams is 15th. Um, they get fouled. Those two and Ivy get fouled uh, an amazing amount so they can beat you at the foul line. And, and now they're going to foul. They're going to put you on the foul line too, but they're not reliant on just one way to beat you. Right. So when you have that and your team is used to doing that, it gives you a real advantage in this tournament because – no matter, I mean, you can bring in the Dalai Lama, you can bring back Phil Jackson, you can bring back, uh, you name it, Dr. Phil. If you're struggling shooting the ball in this tournament, your mind is going to play tricks on you. And and it just happens because the the, the bigger the stage, the, the further in the tournament, the brighter the light, so to speak. And it just messes with your head. And you got to be a great psychologist on the bench with your team, but at the same time, know what's going to win the game for you. Yeah. yeah, I think Purdue was in the double bonus at about the 10 minute mark in the second half. And so yeah. at that point, there was nothing that Texas could do. Even when they went on like small little runs, they're still committing fouls, you know, 85 feet from the basket, put them on the line for two shots. No, you're right. And these teams that foul, like St. Peter's is a great story, but they foul, right? Like they foul a lot. And like in, in, in Kentucky goes 23 or 35 from the foul line the other day. You know, if they make a couple more, it's, that's not even a story. 
But what St. Peter's does is they play really, really hard. Now, Howard, I thought they did a good job, even though uh, Oscar had 30. I thought they did a good job of backing off some of Kentucky's guards, like Xavier Wheeler. They just backed off and, and, and forced those guys to make plays. Well, you can't do that against Purdue, right? Like there's nobody on that lineup that you can really cheat off of. So what are you going to do? Are you going to zone? Where's your double going to come from? But the fact of the matter is St. Peter's follows you. And, and I think that plays right into the hands of Purdue inside of this game. And again, because they can shoot the three at such a high level, it's an added bonus. The fact that they've got two guys that are impossible to guard inside and that Ivy can get to the rim on anybody right now in the college game, I, I think is a real benefit for them. I, uh, I need to know, uh, for my own purposes and entertainment watching this game coming up, uh, is your brother, or excuse me, is your brother-in-law, Coach Harbaugh, going to be at the Michigan Villanova game? You know what? Knowing him, it, it I would I would it's in Chicago, right? Or no, no, that one's in Philly. Philly, yeah. All right, no. Wait, is Philly. it? I'm not sure where that one's I don't know if that one's gonna be in Philly. There's another one that's gonna Hold be in on. Philly. I will tell you. That game I, Saint Saint Peter's is playing in that Philly. That game is gonna be in San Antonio. I apologize. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think he's got practice. I have not talked to him this week. I talked to him last Friday. Um, knowing him, he probably will. I mean, and, and, and I wouldn't be surprised, especially with the support that Juwan has given him. I think a lot of it would depend on, on his practice. But knowing him, he probably will. I mean, he, uh, he, he went to Miami to watch WWE at one point or Vegas or wherever he – Miami, I guess it was. I mean, he just jumps in a plane and he's gone. He's a sports nut, and I know he loves Michigan sports, so I would imagine he probably would. How – just from a, a – like – managing the the team perspective you, you know you, you obviously had a, a final four run with Marquette in terms of going from the first weekend to the second how hard is it to keep the kids focused because I'd imagine I mean it's you come back the campus is buzzing everyone wants to have a good time is it very difficult to keep everyone focused in these few days leading up to the next task at hand in the sweet 16 Absolutely. And the only thing harder is when you go from the final eight to the final four that week. No, I, I'll never forget it. We, we, we won two games. We beat Holy Cross and then we beat Missouri and we go in the locker room and I've got walk-ons doing interviews. After the game, <laughs> right? And I swear to God. And then, and then you come back and now they're not only doing interviews. I mean, they got three or four people around them. So especially if, if you don't have a setup, like if your SID media relations director doesn't have a real understanding of this, if they become fans in this, it's a problem. And I think it can be really, really distraction focused. I've said for a long time, you know, the, the, the more you go up the ladder, the more people want answers from you, the more you better have questions, right? So your questions better be like, okay, when am I getting in the gym to make sure I'm getting my shots? When am I going to watch extra film? What's my routine? If you get off your routine, and you get in and you get caught up in so much of this. And remember when back then the social media wasn't even remotely a, 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 an issue like it is now. So I think the teams like the teams that were leaving, like I know if Michigan State would have would have won on Sunday, they were flying home and they were going to leave for San Francisco last night. Like the teams that get out of town early right now have a real advantage. Yeah. Uh, to get in, get get situated, get in their film rooms, get their war room set up, so to speak, you know, social media is still there, but, but they're locked in and, and, and the people that are spending all their time, like I always say, don't take a breath, right? Like don't take a breath, you know, you catch your breath. Okay. Real quick, but you don't sit there and take a breath because now, as soon as you do that, now you start resting and you start thinking about what you did versus focused on what you've got to go do. And then when it hits all of a sudden, like you cannot prepare your mind for 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 that day right and for the for the elite eight no matter how hard you try unless you've been there and know how to get yourself ready for it the best way possible going in because if you get off and, and this is what happens you could see it the other day in the games when guys start getting out of character when they start making trying to make plays that they can't make taking shots that they can't take what they're telling you, they're not only telling you that they're not locked into you, they're thinking about their future. Mm -hmm. And I think every step of the way you go up here, you got to be fighting the next level, right? Like the better you play, the better at your opportunity for the next level. The worst thing you can do is go prove to the next level something that you can't do. And you you watch it. There'll be games on Thursday and Friday night. You would say, why is he taking that shot? Why is he doing that? Why did he commit that foul? Because they get distracted. They lose their sense of purpose on what they're there for.
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, when you were coaching Dwayne Wade, when you were making your run to the to the Final Four, what was his mentality like in between those weekends? Like over the course of the week that you guys came back and you know you're going to the Sweet Sixteen, what was he like in practice just around the facility? His was great. His was great, and that in turn made it be great for everybody else. Guys like Travis Dean or Steve Novak was a freshman at that point, and he was already a great worker. But when your best player is leading the way. And, and, and he had fun and he was great with his teammates, but there were no games, you know, when he got to the gym, there, there were no, you know, I never, I don't remember ever having to get him back. Okay. To, 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 to square it away. The only time that my team let down a little bit where, where, where the distractions hit were practicing before the sweet 16 game against Pittsburgh. And I think we're practicing at St. Thomas. And I let people come into the practice and there's media waiting around and things like that. That was the only time because our work at, at Marquette was good. But that was the only time that we got to the gym for the open practice that I really jumped them. I mean, I cleared the rock locker room other the coaches and I jumped them because I think what happens and you'll see this this weekend. OK, teams go. OK, they, 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 they have in their mind how far they can go. Right. And the only time that my I got nervous about where my team was at was at that, or that that practice in Minnesota with like, okay, they've gone as far as they think they can go. They're happy with being here. And I think it happens to teams. It, it, it really does because they don't expect to get where they're at, so they don't know how to deal with it. But we went out and everything kind of changed from that point on. We beat Pittsburgh. The next day we have a practice before Kentucky. They give you an hour and a half in the arena. Dwayne Wade took three charges inside of that practice. Hmm. I mean, he took three charges inside of a scrimmaging and we didn't scrimmage, but for about 15 minutes, I had two guys go for a loose ball that knocked out five or six chairs uh, near the end zone in the court side and knocked out one of those curtain partition partitions because we didn't call out of bounds. And that was like the best I felt like Kentucky won 26 straight games. They were rolling, but the best I felt like, okay, we're not going to show up in this game and be cannon fodder for Kentucky. We're going to come to play. And I think you got to have those moments inside of your team. But if Dwayne doesn't do that and set the tone, I'm not sure we ever get to that point. That's a great story, and that's a great lesson for this tournament. Um, I had one last question for you, Coach. Uh, it's the Roback question. You take uh, go to roback.com right now, 20% off your first purchase, R-H-O-B-A-C-K.com. Next time you're in New York, I think you're going to come up in a month or so, we got some yeah. rowback for you. You can come visit. R H O. My daughter's moving there. Yeah, R H O B A C K dot com. Use code take for twenty percent off your first purchase. Yes, you better come by and say hello when you come up I here will. to move her in. My last question: Out of all the coaches in the tournament now, uh, and you know a lot of these guys, who would be the most likely in your mind to do vampire bats before the big game to get everyone ready? Wow, that's a good one. <laughs> I'm not sure there's any, I'm not sure there's anybody that has that mentality. If I was going to have to pick, if I was going to have to pick somebody, I would say Calvin Sampson and he would bring the, he would bring the vampire bats and put him in a cage and make him fight. In front of his team. Like, I think he would confine the space a little bit. I don't think he'd let him fly around, but I think he'd make them fight, tear each other up. <laughs> yeah. I say that with all respect. Cause that guy's fearless. I mean, yeah. I love their team. I mean, if they can get fouled, they got a great chance. Uh, that game's going to come down to the offensive rebounding because both teams' offensive rebound it very well. Uh, I, Arizona's a tremendous passing team, but, I mean, the, the team that gets fouled in that game is going to be a difference. But I would say probably Calvin Sampson, but I would say Tommy Lloyd, maybe, even though I don't know him very well. He's got a creative He's got a creative genius going to him. He might pull something like that off. Yeah, I like, I like the Calvin Sampson answer. I mean, Houston, they're just a mean team. Like, they're mean. They're, they're just grown men, and they're just mean. And I, you love watching a team like that where you know what you're going to get out of them. And it's just a toughness that you don't see in every team. No, exactly. They block shots. They get steals. Um, they, 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 they offensive rebound. You know, crazy, they, they don't shoot great from the foul line, which is a huge thing in this tournament. You know, when you get into these arenas, and, and they only shoot 68% from the line, and they don't get fouled a lot. Like I looked at it, they only scored 50, only 15% of their points in a normal game come off the foul line. Like that's a big difference, you know, and something like that for a team that plays as hard. So, I mean, they're going to have to, they're going to have to find a way to make sure that they're getting fouled when you play a team like Arizona, because the last thing you want to do right now is get into a running game with Arizona with the way that they're playing. I mean, they, they can really, really turn it up in a hurry.
So my, my last last question was going to be about Providence because we've talked about Providence for the last month or so and about how uh, their luck this year, everyone keeps saying their luck is going to run out. I'm kind of of the mindset that sometimes if you have a track record of being consistently lucky, it means that you're doing all the stuff, the small things that will translate into you appearing lucky. And when you look at like, you know, the, uh, the Ken Palm rankings, you're going to be outside of that top 20, top 25, yep. but you're still doing small stuff correctly. Do they do enough small stuff correctly to have a chance against Kansas? Oh, I think they do because they play hard. I mean, they really, really play hard. I think they got to get Watson going, and and I think that's going to be huge. I think they play better when they're playing through him. But, I mean, they, they can shoot the ball. I mean, they, they, they've had games where they make 15 threes. Um, you're going to have to shoot it against Kansas. And and that's easier said than done because of the way Kansas defends the three. But, but they can play a lot of different ways. They can play you in the 50s. They can play you in the 80s. They've had that one really bad game like they had against Creighton in the tournament to go get it knocked out of your system. That year that we got beat, or the year that uh, we went to the Final Four, we won the league in Conference USA. We go to the tournament and we lose to UAB in the first round. And Dwayne Wade had a triple-double. Uh, points, rebounds, turnovers, right? And so we come home, we get in the gym, I mean, we got our mind right. And, and I think when you have that late in the season, you know, a close loss doesn't always do that. When you get smacked around a little bit like they did against Creighton, that wakes you up. That gets you locked in. And I think that team is playing with a real purpose. They've been playing like that all year, so they've been really, really consistent. Ed's a really good coach. I wouldn't put the vampire bats past him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, not by any stretch. Uh, I don't know how many you find in Providence, Rhode Island, but, <laughs> but he, he could he'll, he'll get them. Yep. But I think they're I think they're a good team. That them as much as I like Kansas, that would not surprise me. I just think Kansas' is speed uh, and, and, and the matchup issues that they create, they're going to have to play great half-court defense, and that's easier said than done against Kansas. Yeah, we, we love Ed Cooley. We love Providence. Unbelievable season they've had. Um, Coach, this has been awesome. We appreciate it, and uh, we're always rooting for you, and we hope hopefully we'll see you soon in person. You will. No, I appreciate you guys a lot. I appreciate being able to do this, and it's great to see you. Yeah, thanks so much. Great to see you, Coach. Thank you. Tom Crane is brought to you by our friends over at BetterHelp. Relationships can take work. A lot of us will drop anything to go help someone that we care about. We'll go out of our way to treat other people well, but how often do we give ourselves the same treatment? Well, this month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to take care of your most important relationship. That's the one that you have with yourself. You can't help other people if you're not helping yourself first. Whether it's hitting the gym, making time for your haircut, or even trying therapy, you are your own greatest asset. So invest the time and effort into yourself like you do for other people. Therapy can be for everybody. I've gone to therapy when I experienced loss in my life before, and it's helpful to be able to talk out your feelings, share them with somebody else so you don't keep them bottled up. And if you want to be there for someone else, you have to be able to be there for yourself first. BetterHelp is online therapy, offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try. See why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp Online Therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash PMT. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash PMT. Okay, let's wrap up with Guys on Chicks. Uh, Billy, by the way, do you have any future on Kansas? Yes. Okay, because I was going to say, I just saw, I was just looking at Twitter, and on the Barstool Sportsbook, we have an exclusive Gonzaga or Kansas to win the title plus 150. It could be a... That actually is a game changer. That could be a game changer for the spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Okay, so when you go home tonight, take a look at that. That's... Factor that, that in. That could be huge. Yeah, factor that into the numbers. Billy's just going to be hitting up our sportsbook, asking them to put out like boosted specials. Yeah. Specifically to counterbalance yeah. his potential losses. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, chicks. Quick, quick little parental control. I don't know what this segment would be called, but I'm just interested in your comments. Kylie Jenner, Travis Scott, I'm sure you guys saw this news. Did you? Yes. They had their son. Yes. They named him Wolf. And then a month later, they decided that they wanted to change his name. I think you get, I think, I think you can change a kid's name up until a year and a half. What? <laughs> what I do. Yeah. They Having two children listen. myself, I know when my son became, realized his name. 
Also very funny because he learned my name recently. And so Big Cat? No, he'll drop a oh. Dan right in my face every now and then. It's very funny. Um, but, yeah, I think a year and a half is right around when you can change it. And it also has to be the first kid because you can't – if it's the second kid, like if I changed – my you, daughter's name right now, my son would be what, like, what the fuck? Right, because he's now learning her name. Yeah, he yeah. knows her name, right. So, yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. If you name your kid something like Wolf, and they're just, it has to fit them. You almost, you don't want to name your kid Wolf. You want to meet a baby and then experience it for a little bit and determine if it's Wolf worthy. Yeah. It is the second kid. It's the second kid, so they yeah. can't do it. They got Stormy. Stormy. Yeah, they can't do it because then the, the other kid has definitely learned Wolf, and that's confusing as fuck. But I'm just going to take a shot in the dark. No judgment. I have a feeling that these kids probably won't have the most normal upbringing anyway. That's probably correct. Just a shot in the dark. The Kardashian clan, probably not like a typical childhood. Uncle Pro- Skeet. Probably, yeah. probably named the kid after Wolf Blitzer. They're probably yeah. big CNN fans. Yep, that's exactly it. Yeah, they, maybe they got to change it to Rex. There you go, yeah. <laughs> oh, Rex. Yeah. Uh, my fiancé proposed this weekend at a meat ranch. Why <laughs> did he think that was a romantic venue? I still said yes. <laughs> That's a dude's rock moment. It's like, a, <laughs> like what, We're just going to get a big steak after this? What is a meat ranch specifically? Is it like a slaughterhouse? I think there, is it, is what it, ranch wouldn't be a meat ranch? You could have non-meat ranch. Like if you have alpaca farms... But that could be meat. But you don't eat them. You just you could. You, you use their their wool for your own wool. Yeah. Uh, I I just think this is a dude's rock moment. And you said yes, so he kind of he's got the upper hand. Yeah. Well, what this means is he's anchoring you for the rest of your relationship. That his most romantic moments will be spent on things that matter to him. Yeah. No, this is um guys are really stupid and uh have a very big blind spot for like romance at times. Like oh. I got you these flowers. Oh, these flowers are like clearly from the bodega down the street, and you thought of it two seconds ago, like that kind of shit. It's not our strong suit sometimes. Yeah, but if the view is good, it might be justifiable. That's true. Yeah. I'd like to see the meat ranch. And how was the steak? Right. Let's let's find that out as well. Technically, all ranches are meat ranches. Just, yeah, that's a good Rewind. point, Billy. Fifteen seconds. No, it's a, it's seconds. a it's a good point, Billy. <laughs> uh, what about alpaca? Oh no. You can eat them. That's more of like a farm. I think a ranch yeah, is technically true. beef cattle. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I messed up at work and don't know what to do. My boss hey, and wait, I... Wait, wait, wait. When... You're going to bonk me for this, but the phrase meat ranch would make sense as like a euphemism for cum. Yeah, no, that is a bonk. Well, yep, hold on. <laughs> if you think of it like the salad uh, yep. dressing. You are correct. That that's <laughs> 322. Where I'm gonna your start, mind went to. I'm going to start calling it Meat Ranch from now on. PFT calls Meat Ranch. <laughs> Wait, say it again? I, PFT's I, brain I, is I a 16-year-old. I said that uh, <laughs> you guys could call their own cum Meat Ranch because it comes out of their meat. Mm-hmm. And it looks like ranch I'll dressing. In there. Okay, updated. Meat, meat Ranch. Um, Noun, synonym for cum. Oh, we got it. My boss and I have a joke. (laughs) (laughs) My boss and I have a joke that he's my office dad, and it's a purely non-sexual thing. Today I sent an email calling him daddy instead of dad, and that has made things awkward. He showed another coworker in confidence to see if I was hitting on him. Now he thinks I'm into him, and our formerly fun and healthy office dynamic might be completely ruined. Should I just leave town? Yes. I this shit is so weird to me. Like whenever people do, like this is my office husband, my work wife. My, yeah, my work wife. Yeah, that's you're basically just saying we haven't fucked yet, but we would. Yeah, like I, what are you doing? I I I have always been like very uncomfortable. I, I don't know if it happens a lot in real life as much as it does on television, but like going home to your family and being like, yeah, my work wife was yeah. telling me this. Ugh. it's your coworker. Mm-hmm. If I was le- if I was legally allowed to, I'd fuck her. Yeah, daddy, though. Yeah, you can't come back from that. That's like, that's like when you're in like first grade and you call the teacher mom by accident. It's like probably, I would say universally, if you pulled everyone's most like their first memory of being completely embarrassed, it's mm-hmm. that calling your teacher mom. Uh, what's up, boys? I have a question mostly for Bubba. I got hit by a car about three and a half years ago, <laughs> and it's basically my personality in the friend group now. Yep. Is there any escaping this, or will I always just be the friend that got hit by a car? Cut your hair. I was, I was going to say get long hair. <laughs> yeah. That's what I and did. And then cut uh, it. Yeah, get tattoos. Um, 
sleep just a lot. Be re- yeah, be, <laughs> sleep. be really bad at reading. Yeah. Uh, just have other things to get made fun uh, of. Lie about being colorblind to yeah. everybody so yeah. that they make being fun of you colorblind. for that. Being colorblind. Get, I get colorblind way more than hit by a car. Do it really, did, it really did change your brand quite like, a bit. Do you think the car, was a car a bright color? Well, you wouldn't know, but did anyone tell you? Would you have seen it if you weren't colorblind? It was a hit and run. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Imagine if know. it was like, imagine if the, the driver was also colorblind. That'd be colorblind wild. on colorblind crime. Yeah. Wait, when will me. they start policing their own communities, yeah. Big Cat? But they were like, who hit you? Like some gray car. It was, it was <laughs> like a fucking yellow Lambo. You know, <laughs> you could you could also hope that somebody else in your friend group gets hit by a bigger car. Then yeah. they become the car Truck. hit person. Yeah, just invite Tony Stewart to come hang out for a while. <laughs> or Jim Payheim. <laughs> oh, God. What is the best way to get over <laughs> someone without getting under someone else? Wait, what? Oh, oh I get it. Rebound. But you got to work on yourself. Wanna, they don't want. You got to work on yourself. You got to love. You got to learn how to love yourself before you can love someone else mm-hmm. again. Better help. Yeah. No, I honestly like whenever someone uses those cliches. Like, really, the answer is like go out to a bar with your friends and get drunk and have fun. You'll I think feel better. I think the answer is always yeah. Or for do, me, win a bet. Do do anything to take your mind off of the old thing, and it's like the last thing. If you ever go through a breakup, the last thing that you want to do. Is like leave your bed or your couch, but that's also the thing that makes you feel the worst. Yes. So get out there. Actually, just go out there and find a hobby. Yeah. Get a brand new hobby. Just pretend to like something until you actually like it, because that's what most adult hobbies are. Or win a bet. After Wisconsin loss, I won that TCU Arizona over, and I was like, "This is awesome again." All right. Well, this this, this is gonna be a mean one for you then. Last one. Hi, Big Cat, <sighs> PFT, Billy, and Hank. My family does a betting competition for the first weekend of March Madness, where we. Each bet $25 however we want and see who can win the most money. My boyfriend helped me pick my bets, but I didn't realize he was just recommending all of these bets that Big Cat posted on Twitter. Oh, no. Long story short, I lost all my money, and Wait. now my family thinks he's an Illegal. idiot. Illegal. How can Illegal. he win their respect back? Illegal. This is a fake question because I did not lose all my bets on Twitter. I went 7-4 and four the first day. This is a lie. What about the second? It sounds like there was like second day one wasn't group so of bets great. that they followed, but and I, then they're yeah. they're extrapolating that. There are a few accounts that like I'll see that will. It's always funny because I'm not a good gambler, but as anyone knows, you, it's gambling. So you get hot every now and then. Mm-hmm. I've I'll have people like create like fade big cat accounts, and they'll just only count my losses. They'll be like, "Oh, I wasn't fading that win streak that you went on. Mm-hmm. Like I I I missed those." So this guy, he's bullshit. You didn't lose all of it. Also, just take the alternate. It's a girl. Girl, take the alternate. And yeah, I suck at gambling. I'm very clear about that. I don't think I, I don't think I lie about that part. Yeah, I there's think no. There's no pretending. I think you per, you perfectly, averagely suck at gambling though. Like everybody sucks at gambling. Yeah, and I get hot. When I get hot, I'm happy, and I tell everyone I'm hot, and then I get cold, and it sucks, mm-hmm. and I pretend I get hacked. Yep. the uh, The only reason why I'm even still afloat, or I was even at 500, was because of the alternate. The alternate, and because of Jersey Jerry, who was just the hottest gambler in the world. Make it permanent. I really, I think Hank purposely put this question in here because he wants me to make Texas Tech my game of the year. You should. He's been. You've been pushing me to do it. Yo, you've been saying it, and I'm. Why don't you make it your game of the year, Hank? The refs. The refs. If you feel so confident about it. PTSD. No, I'm worried about You're the refs. You're in denial and PTSD I combo. said it before the tournament. This is the game the refs will show up for Coach K. Excuse me, Mike K. Yeah, Mike All-time K. All-time power <laughs> move by I Tom love that. Green. Uh, all right. Um, uh, it took it, us both a second. We're like, yeah. who's, who's Mike K? Mike K is going to sneak into Tom Green's house <laughs> and strangle him. I read an article that uh, Coach K actually, it was an article about Coach K's son-in-laws, and he tried to make them all call him Coach. Yeah, so, I think that's nice. Not on a power trip. Six. What were you going to say? No, go ahead. 41. I was going to say, I don't remember if you said that on the show no, or I off the not. show. No, I did not. It was okay. off the show. Okay. The, the last five days. I know. That's what, that's, why, that's why. 22. Six. 25. 69. But you will hear that story again. That is now part of my Coach K uh, <laughs> repertoire. 64. Original tournament. Fourth time. Fourth time, and we have wh- who's the who's now the goat? Fifty nine, fifty two is 52. the league of and its then own. Forty seven times next, maybe you said yeah, forty seven seven times. Nobody eight. I feel like some of these like on the road ones are like Mickey Mouse championships. It's kind tough. of yeah, they're just they're just random number generators. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to see the code behind those. Love you guys.
Malik Willis did the same throw that uh, Zach Wilson did, but just 10 yards farther. Just wanted to add that as a little note at the end. That throw? All right, yeah, note, farther. note added. It was farther. I want Malik Willis. Give me Malik Willis. Ranchy. I love Carson Wentz. Had two MVP votes in 2017. Give me Malik Willis. Ranches don't necessarily have to be for meat. 